What's going on, everybody? Thank you for joining in tonight. Um, this is a some one of the podcasts I know a lot of Hognose people have been waiting for, and it's uh, Jeff Galewood, JMG Reptiles. Um, he's been in the pod, in the Hognose uh, community for a very, very long time, and you know he's still very re- relevant in the current uh, Hognose com- community. So I'm really excited to have him on. You know, let's get wait wait for a little couple more people to jump on. Let's say hi to a couple people. You know, um, the ambassador herself, Bosa, uh, Aaron. You know, thank you for jumping on, man. Um, Chris and Levi, Sex and Flex and Reptile Podcast. Thank you for jumping on. Jordan Hartman Reptiles. Thanks, thanks for jumping in, man. Uh, Tammy, there we go. You know, people are starting to come on. Thank you. I know a lot of people are definitely, definitely waiting for this uh, podcast and to be able to pick Jeff's uh, brain. Um, Enchanted Hogs, there we go. Eric, um, Jordan, yeah, man, we have a, a good amount of people already in here, and it's gonna keep going. I'm, I'm really excited for this one. Let's see how many people we can get. Uh, Jeff asking questions, and if you've seen any of Jeff's lives on his Instagram or other podcasts, um, he's very knowledgeable. So you ask him a question, and um, he can talk a lot, you know. So it's it's good because he, it's good information that he's given. See Tammy, blue tongue reptiles. What's going on, man? Thank you for uh, jumping on here. You know this guy has been supporting uh, myself and my my uh, social media and stuff like that from the beginning. And he's always been you know very vocal about it with myself and really cool. Um, Jermaine shoveling those hogs. He was the second, the first hog nose, but the second podcast on my podcast, the episodes. So um, all right. So we got about 30 people in here right now. So after rest, uh, serpents, what's going on? Yeah, we're super excited for sure, for sure. I've seen Jeff on hugging out and shoving those hugs. Yeah, um, I know a lot of people are going to be uh, tuning in for this one. So I'm going to bring on Jeff. So make sure you guys are have your questions ready. And we're just going to go and have a good conversation. Um, as I say, so let's get to it. All right, Jeff, we're live, man. How's it going? Hello. How you doing? Good, good, man. Good. So I know we uh, just to warn everybody. Um, we had we we're talking backstage, and he's got females laying right now, so he's gonna be uh, up and check in and getting ready. We might have you know be able to get a sneak peek of what's going on in Jeff's facility today. Yeah, it's just one female actually laying right now. She's right up there. It's a super arctic double hat sunburst female. And I posted her on my stories uh, about her earlier because I was like, she's laying. And then I remembered, that oh, she's actually one that I didn't visibly witness a lock on, which I already knew that. But I remembered that I made a video weeks prior stating how I did not observe any lock and didn't see any evidence such as sperm on her left behind or anything like that. But the evidence that I did see or indicator was her behavior. Um, when I tried to reintroduce a male, she'd get really frantic and she'd be moving around, uh, pretty, um, you know, crazily. She was definitely, uh, very worked up anytime I introduced a male. And then prior to that, uh, before she probably locked, or of course, before she locked, she was a lot more complacent with males. And then all of a sudden, you know, weeks, like after she initially probably locked, she no longer had interest in being around males and was very frantic around them. And so I took that as a good sign that she had locked. And then I was like, all right, I'm not going to even reintroduce males because of her behavior because she's getting so worked up. And hopefully she did lock, which I figured she did based on her behavior. And she's laying all good eggs right now. Nice, man. Nice. You see, man, that that's just experience speaking right there. You know, being able to watch your animal and know the behavior, that's definitely years of experience that, you know, somebody like myself, I'm brand new. You know, I'm I'm still guessing until I see those, those females starting, you know, Going to pre lay shed or actually eggs coming out of the females, I don't know. You know, it's still a gamble for me. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean, but I still, I still get the, um, you know, there, there's still a lot of times where I get nervous about, you know, females breeding. I'm like, oh man, did she actually, you know, is she can, how is she going to lay good eggs? Um, you know, obviously not every clutch I get is perfect or 100% fertile, so I definitely have, you know, a share of like, you know, infertile clutches or not the best fertility. And yeah, and kind of like the female just reading her body language and how she was reacting to males being introduced. 
uh, Mackenzie's in. Hey, sought after serpents. Um, you know, it's just that's what I've kind of always said. Like, like sometimes I post about it, or, or like I'll just say uh, I just listen to what the hog knows tell me, and that's pretty much it. Reading body language and just kind of, you know, learning cues that over time you kind of see that okay, this means this one this happens. So Joe's in here too, hugging out. Another great, great um, so YouTube Joe. Uh, videos on hog noses. Um, he had a really good year this year compared to what he had last year. So oh yeah, I, I tell my man, congratulations because he had a rough last year. Yeah, I mean that's how kind of like you know the thing is he had like two females the last season to breed and yeah the neither one ended up doing uh, real well and then unfortunately the one female, um, you know passed but. You know, that's the thing. It's, you know, if you go, if you have a large enough sample size, I think it's more just bad luck. You know, those two individual girls. Um, and then that one girl he's bringing this year is actually producing a bunch of good eggs. So, you know, that stuff can happen. Like, I have a female right now that, you know, she's, uh, you know, looks perfect. She was supplemented, fed, you know, well. Uh, she's, like, perfect size, really good body structure, head structure tail structure her, her anal plate or ventral is really nice and wide she has really good uh muscle tone and she's like day 17 after her prelay shed and typically after 14 days after a prelay shed there's usually a problem so i was like these eggs in her i could tell by her swelling they're probably all fertile and um you know they were good eggs and <laughs> so they were fertilized eggs but when she does finally lay them, they, I expect them to all be dead. All the embryos will be smothered, and she just retained them too long for whatever reason. There wasn't anything I could do about it, you know. Yeah, man. And, and you know, I think that's that's a very important part because it goes through my head. My first year, you know, this is my first year breeding. I'm just thinking, it's like, you know, what if all my females lay slugs, or you know, something happens, and I don't have any good, you know, um, eggs this year? But it's part of it, right? You gotta be able to yeah. take the losses with the wins. Yeah, and that's kind of just part of the, you know, that happens like every season, even every season. I'm like, I'm like, man, I hope I don't have like a bad season. But as long as I stay on track and just like, you know, it, it's actually good to have the mentality of like worrying about a bad season. Because if you think, ah, oh, everything's fine, everything's good. And if you're not, um, you know, if you don't have a care about it at all, I think you're more likely to, you know, overlook things or not do things as well. You know, versus if you are concerned, you're always going to be paying attention and, you know, trying to, you know, do your best. 100%. Yeah, man. Yeah. If because you're going to be putting effort into it and you're going to make sure that, you know, you get the best outcome of what you're doing. Yep. Hear that, man. So, Joe, I mean, Jeff, um, we, you, I know you've been in breeding for many years. And I'm pretty sure you've told this story a million times, you know. What, how did you start with hog noses and at what age did you start? Uh, well, I got my first hog nose when I was nine. It wasn't right when I turned nine, but I wanted one for my birthday and, you know, you just couldn't find one because back then, um, you know, probably every actually first hog nose I pretty much seen. I mean, I've ever seen some captive born ones, you know, like early on, but generally I was seeing a lot more. Like Jew, like large, well, probably more like sub adult and adult sized ones, and they were definitely all like wild caught. There weren't a lot of captive born hognose back then. You know, the only person that really had a good sized collection of hognose too was Richard Evans, and he was actually working with a majority or a lot of wild caughts and getting ones that were gravid, laying laser eggs, hatching them out. You know, captive hatched babies, and he was of course breeding them because he had albinos, hypos, and you know pastel pinks and those were just starting to come out when I was, um, you know, that age when I was like nine. And uh, yeah, the first like, I don't know how many shows it was, because you know, these are old memories. Uh, so I think it took like three or four reptile shows. My dad taking me to a reptile show until I finally even found we got a hog nose. And there was like a couple of shows in a row because we'd go to the Columbus reptile show, though. Actually, where first like reptile shows started, which were in Ohio, uh, the old armory um in columbus and i remember like it was like the second or third time and it happened back to back where we went to the show and there was a long line waiting to get in the show and we get in there and we're asking everybody does anybody have a hog nose and like one shows up like, yeah we had one and of course it was like you know it was a wild caught that wasn't like really um 
you know, talked about, but that's obviously that's, you know, they were just like, we had one single adult. So it's a wild caught mm-hmm. and it just sold though. Then it, it happened at another show. The second time it happened, I started crying because like this was taking months. And then it was like the same, the same, oh yeah, we just said we sold it five minutes ago. And it was the only one in the whole show. And then like sometime, like, you know, I don't even know how many months later, finally got an adult male and uh, this guy picked it up from somebody. And it definitely had to be a wild caught too. Cause I remember I had him for a long time. And the funny thing is he's actually the one that started my lemon ghost project. Cause he had a lot of yellow on his belly and he was pretty greenish. And uh, he had a lot of, uh, well, not a lot. He had like two or three pretty decent sized scars on him. So something happened to him out there. And I had him for a long while. I had him for probably like 10 years, I think. And um, after I got him, uh, you know, I wanted to, to, to breed him because I was always reading Reptiles Magazine. And one favorite thing that I had of like, or my favorite articles of Reptile Magazine were like the breeder highlights. And there'd always be like a highlight of like a species that, you know, um was the main point of the magazines you know they had like the main article and it'd be everything about that species breeding care you know all that and that was always my favorite part of reptiles magazine that and like you know any other bits and pieces that talked about color morphs and so that's the thing i was interested in genetics pretty much right away because my dad got reptiles magazine and so then i would be looking Mm -hmm. at them all the time and uh yeah by the time i was like you know 10 i uh bred a pair and I roommated them in 10 gallon aquariums in our basement. And it wasn't like, by the time she was laying eggs, I was almost 11. Cause I remember it was May and my birthday's in May. And then they <laughs> hatched out, um, in the summertime. And yeah, from then on, I just kept wanting to get more and more hognose snakes. So, and, That's uh, cute. yeah, it took a while to build my collection though, because, you know, I was using mostly allowance money or birthday money. So by the time I was 13, I think I had like four or five hognose. That's cool, man. And you know what? And it is hearing your story makes me think about because backstage you had asked me, I have a, a 12 year old and then a seven year old. Yeah. Um, I could just imagine my seven year old telling this same story maybe years from now. Right. Like, especially with, with what we got now and where the hog news, you know, is, is going with genetics and all that other stuff. Yeah, That's no, I going to be pretty crazy. It's nice to hear like, um, you know, because there's like a few people where they'll be buying hognose for me and they'll tell me like, Oh, my son really likes this one. And they're like, Oh, my son's like, you know, 10 or 11 or 12. And mm-hmm. you know, then uh, there's hissy hogs and he has a daughter that he's bringing hognose with. And uh, that's really cool to hear. Um, especially when they like, they, they message me and they're like, Hey, they're like, if we get this hognose, can you send like extra stickers or something like that? And uh, you know um, it's definitely um, yeah. Really positive you know, good feeling you get when people are like, oh yeah, I'm getting my kids into this and everything. And, you know, those are the people too, I'd like to see succeed and like do more because they're doing it for the, you know, um, you know, love of the animals and, you know, getting their family involved and everything like that. Yeah, so, man. And you know what, it's going to be the, if we don't get these children involved, involved in, in the hobby, then, you know, it's going to just dwindle and dwindle. You know, we make, we got to make sure the next generation is involved in, in the positive way and get them informed early. You know? Yeah. It, yeah. I think that's a big thing that social media has helped a lot with, you know, uh, big time. And yeah, yeah, it definitely takes, you know, people, um, you know, wanting to share it too. And, um, you know, in like places like, you know, it's like snake discovery, you know, she aims towards like, you know, education and like, you know, uh, you know, a younger crowd. And so, yeah, it's really good to, you know, see all that. I'm going to check on this female too, as we're talking. Yeah, go ahead, right man. Now. Yeah, yeah. I might yeah. even pull the next uh... one. <laughs> Cool, cool. Um, so we're gonna, you know, you're gonna check here. Um, Chris and Levi have a question here. Um, they're asking, how do you establish a hog nose? So I'm guessing they're saying like probably establish feeding after they hatch. Yeah. Um, I have a pinned video on my Instagram, and that's probably the most simplistic way of like um that like demonstrating and how I offer them their first meal. Generally, I don't offer them food until they're about like probably more closer to 10 days after uh hatching because you know hognos do hatch out fairly robust and you know that gives them enough time to um process their remaining egg yolk uh that they they may like still have um and what i do is i take i always start with frozen thawed pinks i tear the face of the pinky dip it in water so it's nice and wet and i put that right up to their mouth and hold it there slowly massage it against their mouth um, and the thing is, is, you know, I try to approach them without startling them, of course, 
you want them to be nice and relaxed and you want them to be kind of just focused on that pinky mouse. And that's one thing having that wetted pinky head really helps with. Because if you get them to drink from it, they're going to pretty much just only be occupied with that task right then and there, which is drinking. And if it's nice and moist, you put it right into their mouth. A lot of times some of that will just automatically go into their mouth. So it forces them to drink a little bit and they're going to taste slash smell that. And a lot of times that's how you get that uh, good feeding response, you know, um, right from that technique. And the cool thing with that technique is, too, you can use it with all kinds of different scents. You can use it with chicken bone broth. You can even make, make, you know, do it with toad because you can get the toad, make the pig head nice and wet, and then rub it into the toad. Um, you can use different, uh, you know, guts work well. That's why, I like, chicken liver and, like, chicken hearts and stuff like that work. And, you know, you can use amphibian guts, sometimes even other mouse guts, even though it sounds disgusting. That's what the, you know, sometimes carnivorous animals like. And, you know, the hog is definitely like that. And so, you know, there's a bunch of different scents you can use, like, you know, salmon, uh, tuna and stuff. You know, I, I like I use sardine a lot uh, in fresh water or spring water. So, you know, that's easy to get nice and juicy because, you know, those come canned with um, liquid, you know, along with them. But generally, you know, I'm starting, I'm just doing the frozen thawed pink just dipped in water. And I can get about 90 some percent of babies to eat just with that technique. And I make their enclosure fairly simple. I don't want them to be able to hide and go real deep in the substrate. And, you know, if you have a bunch of babies, you can't just go and disturb them, you know, whenever. Um, in some cases, you know, you can disturb them, pick them up, get them to call, calm down and get them to eat. But if you have like, you know, a bunch of hides and stuff like that, you know, the baby hoggos are going to be doing different things at all different times. And so if you have to feed a hundred, you can't just be, you know, expecting they're all going to be out all at the same time. You can't just saw out mice for when, oh, I see this one's out. I'm going to get mice out ready, you know, here and now. So what I do is I just make substrate just a little, just deep enough where they can cover up their body. And so then that way, if they are buried, you can kind of just like brush away by their head without, you know, startling them too much. In most cases, it depends on the disposition of each one. And, you know, and then I go through like the process of elimination. I offer them frozen thawed pinks. A few times, I also leave a drop, meaning I just leave it in there and see if they come back around when it's nice and quiet when I'm no longer around. And if they find it, discover it and like it and they eat it that way, then it gets marked, hey, this one likes to eat it dropped. And usually within a few feedings, they'll eat it right from your hand or tongs. And then if they don't eat it that way, I go through scenting. And if scenting doesn't work, I'll try live pinks. And so it's just a process of elimination of doing it that way. And, you know, I set my babies up in these V15 tubs over here. These are visions and, uh, you know, they're nice, long tracked tubs. So it's dark and, you know, quiet there in the back and up front, you know, there's light that can get in. And if they want to go somewhere where it's like a little more secluded, they can just go to the back of the tub. And then as they get big, as they get more um, confident with eating and they get the routine, if you want to start making the bedding deeper or even, you know, offering hides and stuff, you can. So, you know, <clears throat> that technique you're, you're talking about wetting the head, um, yeah. it, you know, I use it for even my adult males, and, you know, and it works. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, I use it, it, for, it really works. Yeah, I do. I, the funny thing is, yeah, if I um, have people reach out to me, it's a bigger, you know, state that's going off feed. Yeah, I tell them, hey, try ripping up the mouse's, like the fuzzies uh, face, mm -hmm. dipping in water and see if that works. A lot of times that does. And yeah, actually, I, yeah, I still do that, too. Uh, that's something I forget to mention. Yeah, like. It works, you know, yeah, on your sub adults and juveniles and, you know, even adults a lot of times. If you have an adult that just kind of doesn't want, you know, the mouse, that can definitely help, you know. And so then you just kind of push it in their face and the, that, um, you know, really, because in the wild, you know, hog nose, you know, they're a bit of ambush predators, but they're not ambush predators like a python or a boa or a corn snake is. You know, they'll lay in areas where like, you know, um, lizards are going to come by or try to hide and then they can ambush little lizards when they're small. But generally, like they're digging up lizard eggs when they're babies. As adults, they're digging up like turtle eggs. They'll even dig up tiger salamanders and toads um, at various stages, you know, of their life. And so some of these prey items, you know, a good majority that they're um, eating, they're not ambushing. They're going, smelling them out, digging them up, finding them and, uh, you know, devouring them. And so when you're pushing that food item, that prey item in their uh, face, you're kind of replicating the way they will discover certain prey in the wild, such as like, you know, a buried toad or turtle eggs. For sure, man. Go, go ahead. and I know you've been trying to ch check that, uh, that, that uh, girl that's lame, man. Yeah, she looks good. Um, 
she definitely has probably about three more eggs in her. I'll probably just pull some eggs out now. Let me see. I could actually pick this up and. She's kind of covering most of the eggs. Nice. And when you, you said that was what? A super Arctic? Yeah. Hit Double hat. Uh, nice. Yeah. Air so, to what? Uh, triple A sunburst. Nice, man. So, which is an Arctic albino anaconda sable. And this is one thing I can show, too, because, like, some people are like, can I disturb them and pull eggs as they're laying? Yeah, you can. You know, I try to just be very careful. Sometimes they're, they don't like it as much. Where the hell's my camera at? Here we are. And this is to prevent her from possibly eating it. <laughs> she probably wouldn't, but, you know. And I, did, I definitely noticed there is kind of a correlation between nest site disturbance and them even eating their eggs. I've had females where they've completely laid a clutch and they buried it perfectly. They mounted it mm -hmm. up. They took their face. They buried it. Um, it's nice and sloped and it looks like probably exactly how they bury um, a clutch in the wild. And I'm like, oh, this looks perfect. I'm going to go up and get my camera, come back and film it. And, you know, you can tell this female has been done laying for probably a couple hours. And just since I was in there disturbing them uh, or disturbing her, I go and get my phone to record it. I come back in and she's got her face digging and going right towards where her eggs are at. And, you know, then I've had ones too where I do that and they come back there. They, then they went and they grabbed one and they have one in their mouth. And so I've seen that a few times. And so I'm like, there's definitely a correlation to that. Um, getting them bigger egg boxes definitely helps. And these uh, rack systems, though, it's pretty hard to get egg boxes that, you know, are really, really deep. So sometimes I will <laughs> convert their entire enclosure to an egg box. And make it like you know like four or five inches deep um sometimes i'll even move them to larger containers and um i've had really good luck with doing this i haven't done it in a little while uh what i would do is get a pretty big container that's probably about like seven inches tall fill it about four and a half inches deep with substrate and about halfway down i would bury a big um lid with a hole in it and a lot of times the lid would take up most of the space of the tub so the only access they would have to get under the lid is to go through the big um hole made in the lid that was you know halfway buried in the substrate and when i did it like that they would always go underneath the lid hollow out a really nice spot and lay their eggs really perfectly kind of like in a line and they looked a lot more organized and it just seemed like it was a better way to you know for to get a you know for to get them to lay in a spot that they felt comfortable in because some of them are very comfortable in these but sometimes they're pacing around a lot and they're just always digging and trying to get deeper and so in those cases sometimes i'll move them to something larger to lay their eggs that's interesting man because like i guess you gotta think about it <clears throat> if the you know even though we're using containers you know to simulate like a like a burrow or something um it's still clear you know, so they can they can see through it and, and probably not feel as safe if, if they would be laying in an enclosed burrow, you know, or like you said, when you have substrate on top of it already. Yeah. Yeah. And then naturally where they're going to lay their eggs, you know, they're going to be, um, you know, more vulnerable. So they're going to be more of a more aware of disturbances. So they want to go somewhere where it's really quiet. And so the deeper they are and if there's like no movement and nothing messing with them, they're going to, you know, feel better in a uh, you know nest site like that and so so far we got six eggs from her nice. oh wait no we got way more <laughs> that's always great to see you know more yeah, not not way way more but you know she was like she's yeah. tucked up and hiding under and she's a first year female so i wasn't expecting a real big clutch but there's actually two more so there's eight and then she has like another like probably two or three in her and they all look perfect. So, you know, that's a nice size clutch. And they're not the smallest eggs either. They're like a nice average size. They're slightly above average size there. So what, what's a good year for you? Like, you know, like a good, how many hogs? It, it's a good, good year for you, for, to, you, for you to hatch out. Well, I'm hard to please, I guess, because I kind of just like, <laughs> um, have um you know ideas and images i make up in my mind of what i want the breeding season to be like and you know projects i want to do so i always 
try to probably aim higher than that's probably achievable every time, but I'd base it more off of certain projects. Like, so I could have like a pretty good year and let's say I have like, you know, really high fertility and most of my females lay, but let's say if 5% of my females that were from really cool projects or ones I'm really interested in pursuing and they don't perform that well, I'm going to be agitated by about the season. And then like people like Tim, like my friend, he'll be like, Oh yeah, man. He's really, you know, optimistic. He's like, yeah, but you produced all this good stuff. You did this. And I'll be like, shut up, Tim. I was like, this is what I want to talk about right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And I think too, because, you know, you have so many years doing it where, you know, you've produced the quantities. Now you're producing, now you, you want to, you have certain goals or certain, like you said, projects yeah, that you want to produce. Exactly. Like quantities, like nice and stuff. And it's good to have animals, you know, to sell since I have to, you know, um, use money to facilitate, you know, running all this and the pain for everything. But yeah, it's definitely, especially projects um, that you want to see, you know, you want to see the animals. Cause that's, you know, what's always fun is like, you know, hitting new uh, morphs that you haven't produced before or morph combinations, seeing something new and interesting that definitely, you know, keeps a lot of the, the excitement going. Um, but, you know, I'm still like, you know, very happy with, you know, producing, you know, like this year, I don't expect to produce like anything that would be considered like, a, you know, world's first or anything like that. But I just more or less want to get on track for projects in a few years from now. Um, and, you know, some of these things take a long time. Like I have projects right now I'm working on that might take five, seven years. And, you know, it's like the time's, you know, going to pass. So I'll have those projects and I have a bunch of other exciting stuff to work on, yeah. you know, along the whole, you know, way and journey. Especially, you know, with all the polygenic stuff that you do, um, that's, yeah. that's, those are really really long projects to out cross cross back in. Um, yeah. Generally. Yeah. If you hear, I'm talking about like, Hey, I like that. I got this project, but you know, some of these really nice projects, like, you know, that, uh, that I'm pursuing or projects I want to pursue. And they're like five, seven year projects. Generally when I'm saying that you could pretty much interpret that involves a polygenic trait mixed with something else. Cause those do take the longest. Um, the polygenic stuff holds their value the longest. Um, right now they're definitely not the most, sought after because most people want to get you know recessive traits and incomplete dominant traits because things are um, a little easier to discern because like it's like it's this or it isn't and um it's not as you know much work because having the line breed stuff and selectively breed stuff back can be you know very tedious and really it's just you have to have an insane amount of patience um and then if you mess certain stuff up along the ways or you're not using the best quality stuff down the road, you can be actually kind of shortchanged on your um, outcome because initially you started, let's say, with an animal that was like, let's say it's a lemon ghost is like, you know, 60 some percent, you know, lemon ghost. And it was like, you know, just a somewhat OK, nice one versus getting a couple really nice ones. But a lot of times with these polygenics, even if you don't start out with like the best one and you make combinations with it you generally do have to incorporate some new lineages at some point so you can always bring in nice stuff down the road so it's not like you know if you don't start out with the best like the project yeah. shot or whatever oh, i'm doing a podcast in here so okay. um you know and when when did you i want to say when did you decide you want to do this as like a full-time job and this is like that the, I guess, i'm guessing this is your dream job man yeah pretty much you know, careful what you wish for, but you know, <laughs> no, I like doing this. There wouldn't, there wouldn't be anything else that I'd like doing more, uh, especially because, uh, you know, hognose snakes are by far my favorite species. I get to work with them luckily. And luckily I live in the country where, um, they're native to, and there's all these morphs. Uh, and again, you know, there's uh, a bunch of other people that share that similar, you know, um, you know, thought process, because if it wasn't for people like you and everybody that's listening right now, I wouldn't be able to do this. So, you know, nobody would be able to, because like, you know, so the whole reptile community is based off of, you know, the common interest we all have with one another as we have a shared interest in the species of reptile. Now, some like certain species more than others, but, you know, that's what keeps this whole hobby and dream alive is we have a, uh, strong and growing community of people that share this interest just kind of like you know a lot of other things but we were into you know this uh hobby and business of you know providing animals and information to 
people, you know, that again, just share that same hobby. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what, man, like <clears throat> I said, it, it's not like a dry goods stuff, you know, stock that we're working with and, you know, our customers and each other, a lot of these purchases we make, or, you know, when we get these animals, it's a, it's, there's an emotional attached to this, this, uh, this animal and the, whatever it costs too. So it's, um, it's hard to just like, you know, go full business and detach yourself from like the hobby part of it too. Yeah, no, you definitely have to do, you do both. And that's the thing, like, you know, most of my income and money uh, extra will go into my business. And so like, like my, my living area is pretty small. Now my facility that's attached is rather large. And if I have extra money, it's like, well, what am I going to buy? Should, can I, can I buy a car or should I buy more hog nose? Now, if I, as long as I have a car that's functional, it's always hog nose. So that's like, actually is, uh, I'm not going to say who it was, but it's somebody that, um, you know, is a bigger breeder and they've been doing really well. And uh, there's a few other breeders that are buying stuff from them and they're like high dollar animals and they wanted to compare cars. And so they all had these different high end cars or collection cars. And they asked me what I drove. And I was like, I drive a 2019 CRV Honda. <laughs> and I was like, it works really well. And I was like, it's not going to break down. So I don't have to worry about taking it in much. Like them and Toyotas last a while. And so it could just down to the Honda and the Toyota and it gets really good gas mileage. But um, I might get something else like another CRV because my mom's always using the CRV to run like things for like shipments or materials and stuff like that. But yeah, going to the, the whole business side, it was the one question you initially asked me, like, when did I uh, decide I wanted mm -hmm. to start doing this? Um, you know, it kind of started with like geckos more, um, even though I actually had hogos before I had geckos. I started getting geckos because I like I like genetics and I seen that you could breed them a little quicker and that they're they were affordable and I could actually, you know, invest in some projects where I could, you know, breed some animals that involved, you know, genetic traits and selectively line breeding. And that really appealed to me. Um, you know, I had hog nose at that time that I was, you know, getting that I was gonna selectively line breed, like, you know, stuff that was lighter colored, stuff that was a little more greenish, but you know, it was a very small starting base. I didn't have a lot of money. So my dad, um, you know, is always, of course, taking me shows and, you know, he's very involved with my life and everything, always taking me fishing and hiking. And so that's the thing. That's like, you know, it's really good to have um, a strong, you know, presence of family to support you and stuff. Because if I was just like, let's say, um, in a household where my parents didn't like reptiles or they're like, hey, you can't do this or we don't like you're like, how are you going to make money off of? keeping snakes and geckos, although that wasn't the initial point. The whole initial point was never really to make money on this um, when I was young. But as I, you know, I mean, it, it evolved pretty quickly. Even by 13 and 14, you know, I was aware of all of these ball python morphs and, you know, prices they went for. And I did find it really cool that you could breed these animals for some monetary gain and stuff. And then you could buy higher end, you know, like I'd look at pictures of like albino red tail boas and piebald ball pythons and just be, you know, in, you know, completely um you know enthralled amazed i guess it, yeah. Yeah, yeah amazed with like the prices and how cool these animals looked and that you know there was this you know market even though i didn't really process it like that in my mind that there was this market where people were willing to pay this much for these animals but you know as i bred geckos with my dad and stuff and we grew more and more and the whole thing was he's like, well i'll invest some money and as long as i stayed interested we'd slowly invest more. And then he would just write down these like, well, we're going to write down what was invested. And as a, we make money, it's got to pay off these investments or me, <laughs> meaning him. And then once it gets caught up, then we can start dividing the money and stuff like that. And so, you know, I never <laughs> gave up and I just kept getting more and more interested. And during that whole time, I was growing my hog nose collection more and more, but it took a really long time. And, you know, the market was, it's funny. Some people probably think it's harder now. Everybody always looks at things like, as it's being as it being harder because if they're new, it just everything looks hard because it's like I don't know, I'm new to this. Back then, I'd say things were way harder. Now it's like way easier to definitely make money off the you know breeding reptiles substantially easier um, with certain like you know um, species. Like back then, ball pythons and red tail boas they were definitely lucrative, but. You know, I was told by so many people, like, you know, you can't do this for a living. And then, you know, like, my dad was like, he goes, he goes, yeah, you could probably do this for a living and stuff. He goes, but you're never going to be rich. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. I was like, you know, I just want to be able to do this. And he goes, you, and he said, he goes, well, you should still learn some other trades or 
you know, learn other skills in case you have to do both. And so, you know, I did do drywall finishing. And by the time I was 20, 21, I went full time. And that, at that point, we had my dad and I had whiteout fat tail geckos, a bunch of leopard gecko projects. Um, I had like red face hog nose, my lemon ghost stuff, some Woma stuff. But then the hog nose were, they're were very popular, but the morphs, they, they were popular too, but there wasn't a community and market like there is now. That's for sure. Like, you know, you could have produced like tons of like super arctics back then and stuff. And there would have been people that were interested, but it'd be like minuscule compared to now. Yeah. And, and you know what? I think we're still so early in the stages of hog noses with genetics and, and the growth of, you know, the growth potential of the market where people like myself, we can still come in and, you know, start breeding and make good projects or hell, you know, maybe even um, discover a new morph or something. So I think that's yeah. pretty exciting. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's the the hognose snakes. In my like opinion, from what I've seen, there's a very small sample size of hognose, um, you know, in the hobby that started from. And by small sample size, I'm referring to what was initially taken from the wild. And there's a lot of morphs, considering the small amount that were initially taken from the wild, because like you know, a lot of these hognose that came from the wild. A lot of them may not have gotten bred. Most of them, like a good portion, didn't. And so there's been a lot of, you know, hog nose are, you know, descendants from wild um, animals. But there's like a lot of morphs. Like even Dan Eby, he kept back like, you know, over the years, maybe 20 some hog nose he's caught and has bred them. And he happened to hit the sable morph, which was really, you know, helped the hog nose community and revolutionized, like, you know, um, you know, uh, enhancing trait. Um you know, to combine into all these existing morphs because Sable's definitely made a whole lot of like, you know, um, projects and fun projects with, you know, any of these other existing morphs because Sable looks good in pretty much everything. But, you know, I think there's definitely new genes that are going to be popping out for quite a while. I mean, it seems like every three, four years so far, it's been like a perfect rate. That's kind of what you want. You don't want a bunch of new morphs to come out all at once. You don't want like four or five all at once, all around the same time. You know, that floods things. There's only so much money to go around. Um, and that can add like, you know, just a little too much um, uh, excitement, I guess, or just too many morphs all at once. But yeah, every three, four years, there seems to be something new popping up. Yeah, so we're talking about morphs. Uh, Nick mentioned something earlier about pathogenics, like, People not lab labeling polygenics appropriate. What do you think about this? Like, you know, I think you're one of the people that are mostly working with polygenics and have a large collection of them. Yeah, polygenic traits. Yeah, that that is a common thing, and a lot of it isn't like you know. What are there's there's two aspects of it. Um, people just not understanding completely, or people using it as a marketing ta uh, you know tactic. Like, you know, A, if I just say this has some purple lineage in it, now it has a little bonus um, going along with it. And I can ask a little more or make it a little more marketable to sell. And But, you know, a lot of times you can see in certain animals, if somebody's labeling it purple line and it doesn't really look that red at all, you know, there's a pretty good indicator like, hey, this is a cross. But the best thing to do is to ask the person, what were the parents that made them? Um, yeah, that could lead to the thing, the annoying part, which I'd never want to really suggest is asking for pictures of the parents because that just gets to be a little too much excessive uh, work to do. Can I just have pictures of the parents? How about pictures? Like, I have people ask for pictures of the grandparents and I'm like, man, where does this end? Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's, you know, there's already, you know, most people's days are already filled up with a bunch of little tasks. You know, you're already answering all the questions, taking the photos, getting the weights of the animals, doing what, what else you're ever doing. But, you know, it's up to the individual, you know, if they want to take pictures of the parents. But, you know, the polygenic traits, too, the, the other difficult thing can be photographing them. Sometimes they don't photograph the best. You got to get the lighting right to really, um, you know, show. Express what it, yeah, yeah, what it shows. Exactly. Yeah. Yep, make yeah. sure, yeah, expresses the, you know, makes the animal – to look the way it's supposed to. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I yeah, think that's, so, that's important what we're doing now, you know, getting ourselves out on, especially what we have nowadays, the social media, the internet, YouTube, because when somebody goes and looks for a hog nose, it's hard if, if somebody's never heard of you, you know, but you know, like yourself, you yeah. have many years of, of uh, breeding. 
Um, you know, you're pretty you were pretty easy to find on Instagram with Hognose stuff, especially with your your other account. Um, you know, you had a lot of content followers and stuff, so you know you're buying it from somebody that's been around for a while. Yeah, then they have like Morph Market. Morph Market's really nice because you know people have to like you know actually register and sign up, and so it's the likelihood of getting scammed on Morph Market's very low. It's possible, but it's very very low. But yeah, the polygenic thing is it's tough because there has been a lot of like uh, probably like um, in a way a form of mislabeling because when people are just posting stuff and like saying, hey, this is purple lime, this is extreme red, this is lemon ghost. Uh, it's like, well, where do the animals they get originate from? What quality did they initially get? Were they close to a peer? Was it closer like to 100 percent? Now, if you have anything over 90 percent and it's like, you know, mostly pure i consider that just pretty much as good as pure if it's got the quality um you know but there's a lot of because like you know all of a sudden when something because i've seen it in the leopard gecko hobby it happened many times when all of a sudden a polygenic gets more popular and the reason they get more popular in a lot of cases is because they well for one they make really nice stuff and then two they start becoming obscure and then soon before you know it, this obscure polygenic that nobody had, more and more people suddenly start having it out of nowhere. And they find, yeah. you know, animals that are adjacent to it. But it's a lot easier to do in leopard geckos because leopard geckos um, is a lot is pretty convoluted when it comes to polygenics. And since uh, my you know past history working with leopard geckos and just seeing how the hobby and community and how people react and understand and interpret polygenics really definitely helped me um, not only understand polygenics through research and actually working with the animals, but how people interpret the information and use the information, whether it be, you know, um, using it as marketing tech tactics, like the things I'm seeing in the hog nose community that happen is like identical to what I'd see happen in the leopard gecko industry. It's just a different animal, the same human psychology, just being applied to a, you know, different area. Yeah, I totally agree. And I see it all the time, like you said, you know, especially the albino, you know, like high red or, you know, high purples and stuff like that. Those little phrases, those little catchphrases, I say, you know, to maybe up the animal 50, 100 bucks. I, I see it a lot on Morph Market. Yeah. Yeah. So you just got to be careful of that. But the thing is, too, if you're only paying a little more extra, you know, and you can just ask the person like, hey, what percent is this? you know, what was the, you know, parents, how nice were they? And so then even if it is a cross and they say, Hey, yeah, the, the dad was a really nice purple line. Just ask for pictures of the dad then and see how nice that dude is. Um, but yeah, it's a, uh, the thing is polygenics, there is some variability to it. So you could breed two really nice animals together. And every now and then you might get one that's like more, um, you know, subpar in pigmentation, you know, not as expressive mm -hmm. as the other ones, um, not as color saturated, but if you have like really good quality, like, like my really good quality lemon ghost and like albinos, if you breed them together, like these really high percent, you know, lineages, you're getting all nice animals. Like some will come out not as nice as others, but you know, they're all generally pretty good. Um, so it's, yeah, I think as time goes on and more people start to understand polygenics, um, you know, things will definitely be a little agree, more easier man. to identify. Yeah, and, and now you I mean through our messages I, I mentioned to you, you know, like I think that's definitely the future of um of hog noses, polygenics, adding them to the recessive. It's just gonna set that, you know, that recessive to next to the next level when you start adding the polygenics to it. Yeah, because it takes a lot of time and patience and it takes a lot of dedication uh, dedication to the project. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and it's going to be a route that not everybody wants to take because of that lengthy, painful process. But you know, yeah, when you finally do get the results, it's going to definitely um, show up and look really, really good. I mean, because that's the only way to really add a lot of color to a lot of these, you know, traits we have. Unless there's a new yeah. trait that pops up that accelerates pigment. But even if you do say, let's say we pop up with a trait that's like similar to like Enchi ball python or a pastel ball python polygenics still play hand in hand with those very strongly you know it's like you even see it in ball pythons um they don't really like selectively breed but they actually well they actually do they just do what i mean is they don't do it um um so you know that's like um 
like you said, like maybe not selective. Well, it is selective breeding because what I've heard, there's certain genetics that um, get changed a little bit, but it's probably the same thing. It's just a higher quality or different quality of that same recessive, right? Well, yeah, like so, let's say they're taking like an orange dream ball python, pastel, or enchi, or even albino ball python. It's like you'd see people sell high contrast albino ball pythons, and there'd be like these more like kind of like faded looking ones. And it's like, well, they're not line breeding the albino. You know, you can't line breed this albino. It's double, you know, it's got, you know, two alleles for the albino gene, and they're terosane negative. So they're not able to produce melanin. And it's like, you can't line breed albinos to be more albino-y. It's like, well, what's changing? It's the, you know, wild type alleles. So these ones that are higher contrast have deeper, um, more clean, saturated pigment. And then in the albino, it's being cut off and it's um, being a brighter, you know, expressive individual. So when people had like pastel ball pythons that were like considered like um, lower expression pastels or lower quality uh, pastels, that's because of the wild type allele that was present. And even with the super pastels, it's not like, cause it's not on just the same location. It's all these other alleles, all that contribute to the animal's natural pigmentation. So as you see people with higher quality pastels, higher quality entries, higher, higher quality orange dreams, if you were to strip away all those traits and just show it as a plain wild type, it'd be a very, very pretty wild type. And somebody actually did it um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, and not, well, not purposely, they hit the odds. They had, it was like an orange dream, um, like Enchi. And they, there was also Piebald, I remember, like in the mix. And they were making a triple, like recessive. And they ended up hitting one that was a complete normal wild type. And it was just this very bright, normal, orangish, goldish ball python with a lot of nice black markings with a bunch of high white uh, borders all around the black. And they're like, this thing is just like, they're like, there's no other traits in here like this. It's definitely not an orange dream. And they're like, this is a very pretty individual. And it's like, well, because this whole time, a lot of these ball python breeders were like, um, not knowingly really selectively line breeding. Because by keeping the best entries, you're actually keeping the ones that had wild type alleles that were complementing the entry and stuff. And so if you actually look at, they are, they're just doing like a, um, a slower version kind of, well, not really a slower version. Um, they are selectively line breeding while simultaneously making morph combinations. You know, by selecting your mm -hmm. best entries, you're selecting the entry that's reacting the, you know, the best with the uh, wild type alleles that, you know, make that animal animal brighter and prettier. So selectively, you know, line breeding and polygenics is actually occurring like all the time. Even like beaded lizards. I was talking to, to uh, Steve uh, Angeli um, in uh, uh, Oregon and uh, well, I seen him in Sacramento. I didn't talk to him there, but he's been selectively line breeding beaded lizards for a long time. And I actually didn't know anybody was, he has these ones with these high yellow markings. So it's pretty easy to do. So you can selectively line breed while also working towards making multiple recessive combinations. Now it's not going to get you, you know, to places faster versus using, you know, something like a straw, like, you know, starting with a project like lemon ghost or red, where you're predominantly, so your only focus is to make a really red or really yellow animal. Um, or if you're using like a, you know, pattern, something like Jaguar, where you're really trying to like just focus on Jaguar. And then once you have this really strong selectively line bred trait, this polygenic, um, you know, man-made selectively line bred trait, you can then incorporate genes, but then, you know, you have to keep breeding them back. Um, no, but sure, with, any, yeah. you know, with any of these like selectively line bred traits, even if you aren't doing direct line breeding, you're not doing too much inbreeding, there does have to be some outcrossing at some point. So why not outcross them into something awesome, like a toffee belly, albino or albino or sable or something like that. And then you can bring in something new. And a lot of times when you outcross um, and then you bring it back in, you're actually adding a variation of wild type alleles that can actually sometimes complement these polygenic traits. Yeah, man. That's like the the extreme red, the purple line extreme red super con that I got from you. Man, like <clears throat> over the, the last, basically almost the, almost the last year, it's been crazy. Like the, the red markings on her head are just getting deeper and deeper. Um, and then... That purple line on the scales and between the scales, it makes a di big difference, man. Um, I'm I'm really happy every time I just show her off. Everybody's like, "Oh my god, that's a that's a crazy looking hog right there." Yeah, she's a nice one. And one thing I liked about her a lot too, and you like you noticed when I saw her too, is that she has really good head structure. Yeah, and yeah, and that's the one because the, the one thing is like I probably uh, shortchanged myself on the extreme red purple line stuff because all those actually have my own red phase lineage in them too. 
because when I was 15, I really wanted to get red face hog nose and I got one from Richard Evans. And every time I try to buy red face from him at Daytona, they'd be like sold out. You'd have like two or three real nice ones. And like, by the time I got there Saturday, even though it was like two hours before the show opened or whatever, even sometimes on Fridays, like when I started vending there, like when I, by the time I was 16, I was vending there and he'd always be sold out as man, this is annoying as fuck. And, um, there's this guy, he's really cool. He's still around Craig Trumbrower. And he would have, uh, he has a lot of different cola brids. I don't think he doesn't work with like hog nose much anymore. I don't think, but he would have a lot of locality specific, uh, Western hog nose. And that's something too, that was really fun. And I really wish still occurred. Um, when I was in my mid teens, you would see a lot of locality types of Western hog nose. I remember this one guy too. I never seen him there again, but it was insane. Um, I think his name's David. Cause I seen him later. I was like, that guy's a herper, but he had, um, like Illinois locality, Western hog nose, which you shouldn't have those. Those are, <laughs> I don't know. At one point they weren't protected like in the like early nineties, but you can't touch those things, but there's Montana locality. I'd see people with Colorado, Nebraska locality, um, New Mexico localities. And a lot of times they'd have the County, but Craig Trumbauer had these reddish face hog nose from, uh, Nebraska and they're like 75 bucks each and they were first generations. And I was like, yeah, and he had them just labeled as reds and they were for, and so I bought those. And I line bred those for a few years up until I was about like nine. Well, I got my first extreme red albino when I was 18. And then by the time it was ready to breed, I already had like third generation red face from these reds that I line bred from wild caught, um, you know, initially individuals from Craig Trumbauer. And I bred my extreme reds into those. And then later I got purple lines incorporated in those too, because you know, I'll, like I've told people, like some, I remember as um, somebody uh, on Facebook shared one of my really nice red albinos and they had it labeled similar to like how I had it labeled extreme purple line, you know, red albino. And somebody says extreme purple line doesn't exist. There's extreme red and purple lines. Like, well, no, it's both of them together. And it also has, you know, my lineage of red too in there as like a, a kind of like a founding base of crossing them into. And that's the thing with all these, like, you know, selectively line bred traits like that. You know, it's good to have, like, some stuff pure. But say if there's extreme reds, because those originated from red phase from Brian Box, and then they were bred in the red phase. It's like, if it was started out with a large enough base, you eventually have to outcross. And outcrossing them to other polygenics that complement them are not bad. It's not bad at all to do. If you, if you got, like, a lemon ghost for me, and you somehow found, like, a really nice yellow jaguar cross and it's like hey this is like something that's really pretty and has a lot of yellow and greens that complements it dan eby has a lot of nice greenish hog nose you can breed lemon ghost into those like it's a little different but the greens and the lemon ghost they're gonna react fairly well um and they're gonna complement one another and then you could also also take those 50 50 green dan line lemon ghost and then breed them back to like a lemon ghost or breed them back to his green lines or you could do it vice versa keep offspring from that and then bring those back around i like to do that a lot i call that stagger breeding and then you can get a higher percent um reaction yield even though they won't read on paper as a high percent if you keep taking a lower percent animal that's staying in the realm of selectively line breeding and then you breed it back to a high percent you get really really good reactions versus just breeding low percents to each other yeah, and you know, and that's how we we're we're coming about all these, you know, new morphs too, trying to figure out, you know, selective breeding wild types. Yeah, you know? and then yeah, breeding stuff back together, you know, like in the wild, you know, there's small populations and you know localities of hog nose and some, you know, inbreeding or what we'd consider inbreeding, um, isn't bad. You just don't want to excessively do it, and you really want to pay attention to the structure of the animal. If you start getting short faces or bigger eyes abort 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 don't keep this going and that's the thing too i see that with like certain extreme reds and purple lines um that's why like you know i have a pretty good uh collection of you know red albinos and they all incorporate purple lines extreme reds and they have a founding of my red lineage in them that has since been kind of just diluted and mixed in and i got some other purple line stuff and some other red phase and red phase lemon ghost crosses to incorporate into them because you kind of always have to be doing some degree of outcrossing to improve and then to also bring back. So, you know, you can add pigmentation and then bring it back. Say, say if you have like a purple line with some extreme red and lemon ghost, that animal is very powerful, especially if it's a higher percent. Um, and you can breed it back into lemon ghost or red stuff. And, you know, you can get the benefit from both sides. Now, if you breed it, say, back to a really nice red, 
and you know you're diluting the lemon ghost you could always take one of those animals later and breed it back to a lemon ghost that has red in it and you're going to get a really really good reaction out of that because that's again you're taking an animal that's been selectively line bred and even though it's kind of staying in the lower percentile you're not doing complete outcrosses you're outcrossing it to stuff that is also complementing it and you're keep bringing it back into lemon ghost so then when you do breed it back you'll get something really really good versus just take yeah i guess the best way because it probably sounds a little confusing when i say it like that and what I mean is, like, versus if you're taking a lemon ghost and you're breeding it to something, then taking those babies and just breeding it to something or back to each other, you're not really improving the percent or the lineage much. Um, and, you know, if you breed those back, you will get to, to a nice lemon ghost. You will get a better one. But if they're just out crosses to stuff that's not complementing it, there's probably not going to be too much, you know, of an improvement when you do bring it back. Are you doing? I say hi. <clears throat> what's going on, Nick? TBM Reptiles. Um, Dustin, what's going on, man? Um, you know, Dustin and um, <clears throat> is working on those really cool um, rack systems that he's building. Oh yeah, with LED lights and um, UV as well. UV, yeah, yeah, that's really cool, really cool. And uh, so Amy had mentioned something earlier, saying that she sees a lot of condas and super arctics mislabeled. What do you think about that? Because, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty easy to, to, to identify a conda. Yes. Um, you know, so if they're being mislabeled, I mean, uh, if to the unknown, to the people that are just coming in, maybe it's, you know, it's deceiving. Um, but I say, you know, if you're you're questioning a labeling on Morph Market or something like that, message somebody that has experience. Mess, you know, I'm pretty, Jeff was always, at, you know, answering questions on his lives. On his Discord, um, you know, reach out to be 100% sure what you're getting. Yeah, um, I, yeah, I've actually seen a decent amount of, like, decent expression arctics or higher expression arctics that are labeled as uh, super arctics. Yeah. I have seen a lot of this. I've actually, I've seen hognose posted, too, that I'm like, that's definitely a male and it's listed as a female. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because some people are still like, well, I tried popping it or whatever. It's like, I would never pop a hognose. I mean, well, to, to use it as, like, a full, like, source or form of like identifying it through its sex that way or i should really say doing a bunch of hognos like that because if you have like one individual and you do put and you're in between like you're like ah, i'm not quite sure and you go to pop mm -hmm. it and you get hemi peens out well then of course that was you know yeah. very successful and definitely tells you which you know what you're looking for but yeah. in as far as using that as a sole source to sex your animals i would never pop or probe hognos um and if you have one that are in between just I raise, I just hang on to those ones, you know, longer until they mature more and I can look at the shape of their tail and determine at that point. What, what do you think about the, the shed testing now that it's going on with uh, sex and yeah. the roots? Yeah, I think that's really exciting. Um, yeah, and they're going to be, they, uh, hopefully they do it for like species too that are very hard to sex as babies. <laughs> um, but yeah, hognose snakes, yeah, they have their, I don't think, because they, first they need to sequence the genome of a hognose which um, they need a wild caught source, um, male, female, to take blood samples from, and it costs quite a bit of money. But eventually they're going to get that done. And then, yeah, there will be shed tests, you know, to determine sex. Also, if they're heterozygous for particular traits, once they sequence the genome and identify, um, you know, traits, then, but once they sequence the genome, they just need to, like, like, from what they've told me, they need, like, 50 to 60 sheds of a specific morph. And then they can find that identifying um, location, the loci of, you know, where that mutant allele is occurring, find that common denominator, and then basically yeah. mark it. And then so then when they send in sheds for tests, they can test it to see if it has an allele for that, uh, you know, gene. So let me ask you, if tomorrow they came out and said, okay, now we have um, shed testing for uh, hognose morphs. Would you send out testing and stuff like that for like, let's say like your 50%, 66% stuff? Yeah, I would. Yeah. Yeah. First, they need to get that. Oh, I think it's going to be a few years. Um, oh, for sure. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, I definitely would. Yeah, then you can definitely determine, you know, which of your pot sets are hats and, you know, don't have to waste any time. And it will definitely um, be interesting because uh, it's, it's going to make it easier to produce morphs um, when that does come out. And the, well, the one thing is too, it depends on the morph too. Like, let's say if I have like a new morph, um, you know, 
nobody can sequence its genome unless I send in the send in the uh, sheds for that, you know, specific right. new mutant gene. But you know, so yeah, so, it'll, it'll be available soon. They're already doing it in ball pythons, and they yeah, want they told me they want to do it with other species too. Yeah, man. You know, so you know, that's another thing too. I know. I think like last year they had like a GoFundMe because it does take a lot of money to research and and map the genome. Um, so that's probably another thing that's slowing it down a little bit, you know, the, getting the, the full funding to be able to map a whole bunch of different species genomes. Yeah. It's like about 30 grand. So yeah, it's a bit of money. So, yeah. So after said that, um, here's a funny one that she saw someone selling a het conda, uh, I guess on morph market or something like that. Yeah. Now, if it's a normal, yeah, then it's like, yeah, that's not, can't be a conda. But if it is a conda, actually all condas, if they just have the single copy, they are heterozygous conda. So, you know, but it's, it's a little, it's not really redundant, but the reptile industry recognizes heterozygous as always uh, means for a simple recessive. When really heterozygous just means, yeah, mixed pair of alleles. So they have one allele for, um, one particular gene and then the other allele is wild type. So an Arctic is heterozygous Arctic. Um, and this is a funny one too, because like I've been breeding some Arctic het leucistic to Arctic het leucistic. And then since the leucistic gene masks the Arctic, although I'm starting to see that there might be some indicators for Arctic leucies actually. But in the meantime, until anybody or myself can determine what makes an Arctic leucistic completely discernible without one of the parents, of course, being super Arctic, if I breed an Arctic het leucistic to Arctic het leucistic and I produce a leucistic and I'm not sure if it's Arctic, it actually has a 66% chance of being possibly heterozygous for Arctic because it's now masked by the leucistic. <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah, man. And that's, that's such a crazy gene. What, what year did the leucistic come out? Do you remember? Oh, shit. Um, early 2000s, but then they were confiscate, confiscated by, um, man, what's that guy's name? I can't remember it. They, go, they call him by his last name. So I was talking to a DNR guy about him, you know, for that to even be something for fish and wildlife to even pay attention to is like mind blowing that they made that big of a deal out of it. And, you know, I get the bureaucracy to a degree. Well, actually, I don't because um, the laws don't make any sense because, you know, I've had people from Colorado reach out, want to buy hog nose snakes. And like, unfortunately, although um, hip hogs has, um, you know, a license to mm -hmm. keep and breed Western hoggos in the state of Colorado. So you can get licensed there. You just have to, you know, go through really the, want to do it. Yeah. You yeah. Go jump through the hoops to get it done. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sure, so I'm glad that they did. And, you know, that's the thing. It's, you know, I'm sure it's not that bad. It's just, you just got to do your research and just really put in the effort and stay on it. And then you can get the license. But in the state of Colorado, um, I'm pretty sure that might be based on certain counties. I think, I think certain counties you can't. But in the majority of counties, from what I understand, um, and actually this does exist in m most of the state, where you can actually take Western hogs from the wild and keep them as pets. And you can take up to like four individuals a year. But I don't think you can ever have more than like, I can't remember how many individuals it is that you can't have in your home. But then once you have them, you can't sell them and you can't cross state lines with them, but you can gift them. And you can actually, I guess, breed them, which is kind of asinine because you can hatch out more than what you're actually allowed to have because who knows how big of a clutch your female is going to lay if yeah. you decide to breed them. It could actually put you over the limit. But then you're allowed to gift them. Um, I don't know about the laws about re-releasing them. Hopefully they don't urge that because you don't want to possibly introduce any diseases into wild populations. But, you know, the biggest threat for them is definitely habitat destruction. Um, definitely doesn't have anything to do with hobbyists or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, Colorado, but basically that guy, what he was doing, because Colorado is actually a state that has um, a strong population, fairly dense population, Western hognose snakes. It has a really rich prairie ecosystem and um, habitat and fauna that support a strong Western hognose population. And, you know, I've heard of people finding six or seven there in a day, which is very good for hognose snakes, uh, you know, especially as reclusive as they are. But so this guy was catching a wild um, hog knows, and a lot of times certain gravid females, he'd let them lay their eggs. And he actually wanted to find a morph. Richard Evans was doing it too. Richard Evans found a hypo doing it that way. That's where a hypo is founded from, um, was hatching out uh, babies from wild females. So this guy was like getting wild females, laying them lay their eggs, hatching them out. And then, yeah, he, he produced some leucistics. And so he had the original 
uh, mom, and then he had the baby she produced. And so he kept them back, started breeding them, and he started selling them over state lines, even though he wasn't supposed to. Uh, eventually, uh, Fish and Wildlife got wind of it, and they made a gigantic sting operation because, you know, why not? Why not? <laughs> um, and then basically, Easy pickings, they, man. <laughs> yeah, and basically, since they were such of high value, you know, he was selling these things for like $10,000 each. Um, basically, these were illegal animals with values of over ten thousand dollars each, which was over five hundred bucks. So it made it a felony, and also it looks good in the court system to say, "Hey, this guy was transporting over a hundred thousand dollars over this period of time of illegal animals," versus saying this guy transported a thousand dollars, you know, of illegal animals. Because what they should have really been basing it off was actually the valuation of a wild type, not a, a morph, because the morph doesn't have anything to really do with this other than the motivation for selling them and yeah and a bunch of people got in trouble and then they confiscated them all then they went to the was it the kansas city zoo i always heard it was the denver zoo originally but i guess it was kansas city and then they had them for a long period of time and then they auctioned them off right back to the general public and to the community that they were taken from well really, really they're they're taken because that guy wasn't supposed to be selling them out of the state of the Col state of colorado but you know he was legally allowed to collect the female and then hatch those babies. He just wasn't allowed to sell them for profit. And then each state line he crossed was a felony. And, you know, just a bunch of bureaucratic stuff to make it sound worse than it actually was. You know, you, they should really be focusing on people that are taking animals from the wild, selling them for profit, um, and just yeah. solely just taking wild animals they're not supposed to be. Most species we have now, there's enough established in captivity where there actually is a less and less demand of wild-caught um, individuals. And if you actually, from the time I was a kid, there was like, a lot of wild caught stuff. When I first want to start going to reptile shows, there's wild caught shit everywhere. And that's all there was a lot of, um, farm raised wild caught. Um, not, there was a, a good amount of captive born stuff too. Uh, but you know, slowly over time that phased out. Now you hardly see any wild caught stuff, you know, and there's like imports still from farm raised animals from Indonesia, but it'd be nice to see all this stuff get established. So, you know, there isn't that demand anymore. And that's kind of mm -hmm. one of the target goals of the reptile community too, I think is to not only, uh, produce like morphs and, you know, fun species to work with, but also make sure that there's enough in captivity where we don't need to take these species in the wild anymore. Like I'm kind of, I'm against them exporting 50,000, you know, farm raised ball pythons out of Africa every year. It's completely unnecessary. And it would actually help the ball python community hugely if they stopped doing it. So at, at this point where you're at with your collection stuff that, you 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 aren't gonna um, introduce wild bloodlines back into your your collection. Oh no, that's not true. I have a few wild bloodline animals. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> In my fourteenth, it does. So here's the thing: there's yeah. certain states that aren't really, um, you know, the, the here's like say Montana. You're still allowed to take hognose from there, mm -hmm. and there's um not really too much habitat destruction going up there yet but like say dan like you know you're like oh he took some like you know these hognose from the wild the area where he took collected the original hat stables is all developments now all those that whole entire area is gone so if he would have left those those snakes would all have no home and they would have all died yeah. so and we probably wouldn't have sables no at this we point. wouldn't yeah we would all be less happy uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, with that, we wouldn't have the knowledge to know why but we would have less genes to work with uh, you know sure. a really important one but yeah so the thing is like i'm not against taking stuff from the wild as long as it's done responsibly um you know and it's, it's like the thing is like you know taking 50 60 thousand ball pipe well, a lot of them were farm raised um and then like you know catching wild females them later I, I don't even know how they get that many i don't even know how it's possible they somehow do it and they do it every year it's like amazing and then the worst part is they're sightings. And you know where to get all exported to is Florida. And then Fish and Wildlife down there, FWC, okays it every time. Oh, 20,000 ball pythons coming in. Oh, this happens every year. Looks good. Sighties means you're supposed to be monitoring the numbers, not just looking at paper and saying, okay. But, you know, they do a bunch of dumb stuff down there, you know, as we know. They're all, they're more ass backwards than, you know, any other tell me about uh, it man yeah <laughs> yeah you know and since we're we're now we're we've touched that subject um i've seen you've posted and you know the, the community right now of what happened like like what two three weeks ago with uh, the burmese retics and that uh boa you know um wh what are your thoughts on 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 that whole situation and like do you think there's anything that could have been done to avoid it on, on, well, on both sides fwc yeah. and the keeper 
Yeah, I mean, the keeper, I mean, I really don't like to, like, I don't, here's the thing. There is a lot of stuff said off camera that we don't know. We definitely know, mm-hmm. like, the first thing I noticed when they pulled him out, like, the first thing they pulled out was a Burmese python. Mm-hmm. And the one, uh, you know, and it looked really good. I was like, this guy doesn't want to take these well, like, these well taken care of good looking animals and just have them straight up euthanized. And it was, like, done on a whim because they said the day before there was a retic loose in the neighborhood. And it's like, well, who the fuck's identifying this? You guys don't even know what a boa constrictor is. Does anybody actually even really see a retic? Because all of his were accounted for. Who else has a retic around there? And those guys can say whatever they want, too. Um, they could just pretend like they've seen one. Um, so hopefully they wouldn't do that. But, you know, I, I'm sure there's some good, you know, people in that, you know, organization. And that they also get funding to, you know, do, um, you know, restoration to habitats and stuff and they get a lot of volunteers so there's good programs the the issues we're having with is with the actual officers that are enforcing these authoritarian uh, authoritarian like laws and just like you know and the the whole disregard for the animal community or pet community that speaks up and just asks for some leeway that guy actually that guy already did everything he should have and could have done. He actually reached out to him and said, hey, I still have trouble getting these 34. All they had to do was, hey, we're going to give you a more allotted amount of time and we're going to give you this X date, six months. It could all have been avoided with that. Instead, they're wasting tax dollars and now they're going to waste a lot more fighting shit because, and they have to. I mean, I don't think it's a problem. We should fight them and make it as painful for them as long as possible to show them that, yeah, you guys shouldn't be just belligerent idiots. Well, it's the law. It's like, well, I understand you clowns just made up shit last week. Good job. That's fine. If somebody asks for more leeway and they're being, you know, honest with you, just do it. That's it. Just be a a normal human. Well, we have, it's like, you guys aren't doing anything. You're not enforcing anything that makes any really matter of a difference. Um, They can lie to themselves and pretend like they are. But the most uh, the invasive species that are doing the most damage to our environment aren't even imported animals. You know, there are things like viburnum leaf beetles, they're, and they're decimating, um, you know, the emerald ash borer, uh, extirpating ash trees across states. Um, and ash trees are a very essential um, tree to a lot of the Midwest. And I don't even know much about ash trees, but the thing is, if you keep removing complete different trees, and then, like, you know, there's... Um, uh, funguses and stuff like that. And, you know, and then even like, like the brown and those Cuban they've talked about those in iguanas. Those kids, like those were around before the pet trade and stuff. And they come in in barges and like, you know, there's uh, other invasive species like the goby and Lake Erie. Those came in in barges. And so, and but the gobies actually don't even do anything. They initially said that they were going to ruin Lake Erie, but that's so they could get funding. I mean, some of the stuff is like overreactions, but the Burmese pythons and this stuff like that, I mean, there definitely is a level of, propaganda behind it because to meet the criteria of propaganda and the definition of it it's basically painting a picture and withholding information to you know basically mass el- hysteria, yeah. yeah or elicit the reaction you want and so then it's evident when they release these reports on burmese pythons this is how much a burmese python has to eat for an adult female to get to 17 foot long and then they have a list of all native species that it eats we know these things are eating a lot of invasive species too so that right there is a lie because they're not ever acknowledging the invasive species they eat these things eat little gators all the time you're telling me that they're not going to eat iguanas that sit in a similar habitat as they do um and then one thing is too i've asked some of these people that collect them i'm like what are you finding mostly in their stomachs and they go, well the babies are like we know they do put a bit of a hurting on the uh, cotton rats which are native down there but he said the big problem is we're never finding anything with them in their stomachs. Most of the time, they don't have stuff in their stomachs. And when they do find something like they found, like you know, they found that one big berm and had a deer in its belly, and they find gators and stuff like that. But you know, gators are another kind of apex predator in that kind of niche. Um, I'd say Burmese pythons, from just logic, I'd say they'd probably put the biggest hurting. And what I'd be most concerned with would be waterfowl because they're laying they're laying in these low um, marshy edges of water and they're way better uh, ambush predators than a gator is to something like ibis um you know herons um any type of waterfowl ducks you know geese anything that's down there like that um and you know know, it'd be interesting to actually see like an updated um assessment on how many actually burmese pythons are out in the you know florida wild 
No. Yeah, and an unbiased one. The one thing too, though, is like you notice is you see a lot of the bigger berms they catch. Like you know, for one, it's hard for them to find berms over like twelve foot. They don't really find that many. Um, the berms that you see, they find a lot of like I know people that go to herping down there all the time. They're like, yeah, I've never found one over twelve foot. Um, they're tough to find, but they find a lot of like seven, eight, and nine footers. And a lot of times these things are pretty lanky and stra- like you know, scraggly looking. And it's like these things aren't like you know they're talking about these things like they're consuming stuff like nonstop. And you know. Habitat destruction, other invasive species, you know, I think are putting a lot more herding. Burmese pythons just um, are the most exciting one to talk about because there's this giant loose, uh, like, python, you know, in the Everglades, and it's doing all this damage to the environment. But then some of the species, too, like, not to sound like I'm uh, being nihilistic or something, but, you know, there's like, well, there's a really small population now in the Everglades of opossums and raccoons. Like, that would be the only area in the United States where there's not that many opossums, raccoons. Everywhere else, there's too many of them. And they've actually affected the fauna in Ohio because there's too many raccoons here. We have, like, way too many raccoons because normally there should be wolves and bobcats around here, but we don't have those. And, well, we have some bobcats, but, you know, how many? Not many. And then they're, like, in states where they're not even supposed to be. They're not really – I don't think possums and raccoons aren't supposed to be, like, west of the Rockies. Well, they definitely are. Um, but, you know, that's, like, one species. And, like, not, not to – you guys are going to complain about raccoons? It's like, you, that's not going to, you know, really harm anything. And if you need them, you can always get them from somewhere else. They're fucking everywhere. Sure, yeah. Yeah, man. yeah I, you know, and I agree, man. Like, th- there could have, on the FWC side and stuff like that, um, and, like, we see m- in many different uh, government entities, there's not enough, um, what's it called, uh, training because there's not enough uh, funding and all this other stuff. Well, if you're going to be implementing all these rules bans regulations then make sure that these people are trained and you know the, the you know they're uh, uh, properly identifying these snakes or whatever animal they're dealing with that's the first fail yeah. there you know um and i think we definitely like you said we need to push you know and make sure that this doesn't just get pushed to the wayside and um just disappears within the other mass stuff that's going on right now yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. Definitely, the training would help a lot. Um, you know, the the pride, There's just so many. The thing is, it's like there's so many species, but really, they only need to focus on a few. You know what I mean? Because like red-tailed boas, you know, boa constrictors. It's one of the most commonly pet, you know, ca- yeah. commonly kept pet snakes. So that should be like a really easy one to identify. I mean, there's like you know, you can find a ten-year-old kid that likes snakes that can identify a red-tailed boa from a retic or you know a berm or anything else. I mean, I know I could have sure. when I was like ten or eleven. And it's like, you know, these guys could just like take the time. And, you know, and then the other thing is, too, it's like, you know, the, during that video, when I watched that video, actually, I was like, I was like, shut up. Because like the one guy's like, it was too bad we have to be doing this, something along those lines. It's like, you don't have to. You can just say you don't want to do it. Just, you know, just say, talk to the other officers. Like, hey, shouldn't we just be like normal people and just say, we could have just gave this guy more time versus just arresting him and then doing this like 12 months rigmarole bullshit of like, you know, just this bureaucratic uh, nonsense. And uh, yeah, that's uh, the whole thing is like, there's just too much nonsense and it's causing them issues and hopefully it causes them more issues so they can, you know, I don't think they'll ever realize, but I mean, I'm sure some do. I mean, there's definitely not all of them. We just got to get it out to, you know, to the mass public, non-reptile community and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, You know, Bosa posted links here, you know, go support US Arc Florida because if you guys don't know, there's U.S. Arc National and then there's U.S. Arc Florida. Um, and then U.S. Arc Florida, you know, needs all the funding they can because I think like a month before this all happened, they had introduced a lawsuit against FWC that still needs to go before a judge and get reviewed. And they're going to need a lot of money to um, push that lawsuit through and keep it going through the whole process. Um, so, you know, take your time. If you guys can go and support us arc do a donation or a membership is the best because it gives them funding and numbers for them to show when they're going through uh the court it's the courts and present this in front of legislators um and us arc florida um yearly their lowest um tier is 35 bucks for the year i think it's, it's nothing right like you, you can go spend that in mcdonald's that starbucks or whatever it is so you know go ahead and support and if you guys are in the, in the South Florida area or can make it down to Miami, May 10th and May 11th, there's going to be a FWC meeting. 
that, you know, everybody at some point of the meeting can talk for three minutes on whatever is not on the agenda. So make sure you guys, if you can be there, be there. That's the only way we're going to be able to keep pushing them and slowing down their all these legislation and bans they're trying to push. Because if we, if we don't put an obstacle in front of them, it's just, just going to do it. And then when we realize what this what's going to happen, it's too late. Yeah, um, that's really well said. Yeah, you know, the other night, the other day was yesterday. I was in no, yesterday morning. I was getting a haircut, and my barber knows that I breed snakes. And he goes, "Man, he goes, I was waiting for you to come in. I wanted to ask you about the FWC thing that I've been seeing on the on the um, news." He goes, "What's what's your insight on it?" He goes, "I know you know probably a lot more than what's going on in the news." We had you know a thirty minute conversation about it while I was getting my haircut. So it is reaching the masses. So it's good to know. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's awesome. Um, the other thing is, like you're saying, support US art. Yeah, even just sharing your stuff, making sure more and more people see it, like forward this to like all of your friends and stuff. Um, even the ones that you say like they don't care, still send it to them. <laughs> if you have sure, friends yeah. like that, yeah. people you know, yeah. um, yeah, because like the thing is, US art, like in Florida, like because that's um, the one thing Daniel's saying, there's there's just so much going on in Florida. That's why they needed to split it because they're like, there's just so much work to be done in Florida. And actually, um, you know, FWC down there has tried to actually make certain things. They try to push certain things and make them federal so they can reach outside their state. So just because it's Florida, don't think it doesn't affect you. It affects you a lot. Florida. And the thing is, if they're able to ever conquer and just kind of ban people from keeping exotics in Florida, they're going to start because they have a division in the southeast and with other FWC agencies, and they're going to start reaching for other states. So make these guys realize that that's not welcome, and they cannot do yeah. that. Yeah. And stay professional, stay educated, yes. you know, um, because that's very important. You you don't want to prove them because a lot of the mindset that these, you know, they try to paint us in the, in the wrong crowd. Like, you know, they're, they're just in, in irate people, you know, reptile people are this and this and that. And if you go out there and act a fool, you're playing into their agenda. Yeah. Yeah, don't yeah, don't even use swear words because they like they want to they want an out. They want an out not to listen to you. So you could give the best well-formed argument, and then at the very bottom, you could sign it just shit. And they're like, oh, oh, he said that, and you don't have to listen to him. So that right. they just use it as an out. So yeah, don't use any swear words or anything like that. Yeah, stay professional. Um, you know, uh Share any aspects where you think it could affect people's lives, just your insight, your knowledge on it, um, you know, stuff like that. Sometimes, like, I think it's even good to appeal to them. These, huh. unfortunately, the, you know, um, people in the government uh, pay attention to money. So, you know, if you're like, hey, I run this business and this feeds my family. Also, I paid this amount in taxes. And if you do this, I won't be paying these taxes. You know, 100%. that's going to probably... Um, unfortunately, be more of a concern of theirs than anything else. The tax money, you know, so. I totally agree, yeah. 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 And then there's just share the love of the reptiles that you have, um, you know, because the more people get involved, the stronger our cause is. Um, you know, I have family members now that, like, after I started breeding hog noses, they want to get hog noses. And, you know, they're, they're, they'll message me, do you have any eggs yet, you know, and stuff like that. So it's pretty cool to see how um, – infectious this this love for reptiles can become yeah oh yeah, yeah. it's definitely grown a lot um you know because like 20 years ago if i was somewhere at a store or you know anywhere like in public and you talk you mentioned like hognose snake or i was talking to a friend you wouldn't ever have anybody that even knew what you're talking about i've actually had yeah. so many people over here in conversation or even at like you know if i'm doing shipments like oh what are you shipping they're like, oh, I've seen hognose snakes. Like, I've seen them on TikTok. I've seen them on Instagram. So, yeah, there's definitely the reach is getting pretty big. And uh, that's been very, very helpful. So, yeah. And I think it's only going to continue to grow. 100%. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we, we, talk, we touched this subject. I think we both have, we, you know, we have great point of views. And I think, you know, don't, don't let it die. I think that's the best thing. Keep pushing for it. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Because keep, even if you keep, feel it, because I've, felt it recently because i've been traveling and stuff and i mm -hmm. almost forget a little bit don't do it just keep sending them letters and messaging them and stuff because that's what they want right. they want to just blow over mm -hmm. yeah, yeah there, there's just hopefully this light silences out and blows over like you said for sure man yeah. 
Um, so I'm gonna had this question for you, man. What is the most like um what is the, the hog nose production you're most uh, proud of? Genetics or combo? Um, probably some of them are ones that I don't really want to talk about yet because they're not completely done, but they're getting okay. there. And I'm finally seeing results with um, these polygenics reacting with uh, other traits. Mm. But, you know, things that I'm really happy with, with combo wise, like, I mean, as far as like stuff that has been more recently produced, um, like super arctic sun, like super arctic blue cystic. I actually, I'll show you one of those. I don't have a lot of them, and I'm trying to make more, of course. But the super arctic Lucy is actually one I'm pretty excited about because I didn't talk to too many people about it over the years. But when people ask me, like, "Hey, you're gonna?" I was like, "Yeah." I was like, "Definitely putting super arctic in Lucy." Like, "Well, you're just gonna make a black eyed Lucy." I was like, "I don't think so. I think it's gonna make their throat translucent, and it should affect their scales, mainly around their throat and their side." What I didn't guess or realize this is going to affect all of their scales because what you're doing with the super arctic is it's like your the super arctic distorts and changes the animals iridophores which iridophores are um you know the pigment cells they're not actually pigment cells they actually just they, they're not a type of pigment they just refract back different light waves but that's how reptiles um are able to camouflage and actually have the full spectrum of pigmentation is because they only produce the xanthophores, earthophores, and melanophores. Everything else is a combination of those iridophores reacting with these other pigment cells and refracting back different light waves. That's why chameleons can pretty much be the full spectrum of light waves, even light or, or uh, colors that we can't see because they're refracting back certain um, you know light waves. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, leucistics typically are just lacking iridophores and chromatophores, and they just got a, a blank white slate. And there's no white pigmentation. You're just seeing their scales, which are, yeah, keratin. And you're just seeing the light that's going into them. It's kind of like looking at snow. Snow's not white, but stacked up with the light hitting it, it appears white. Now, what Super Arctic adds into it is something very, very cool. Because you can actually see the power of what Super Arctic does. And actually, it actually what it can, or actually what it does, without any chromatophores interfering. Because it actually adds iridophores to the leucistic animal. I'm putting on solo mode so we can see this full view. You're going to see in a second. <laughs> and she's in shed, but see those, that white checkering and shattering? Yeah. That's normal Lucy pigmentation. And the mm. rest, she's kind of more of this soft, clear, translucent white. Um, mm -hmm. They often, and you can see it in their scales on her face too. Although this camera's not the best and she's going to be moving. She also just ate. I should get my, my Super Arctic Lucy male. He doesn't have as much calicoing, but he has like really pink cheeks. And the reason his uh, cheeks are so pinkish and shiny is because those are the iridophores refracting back, um, you know, different light waves. So the Super Arctic, you know, and the Lucy re make a pretty cool combination. Okay, Elbow um. is gone oh wait no i just don't no. see you <laughs> no i had you on solo mode so <laughs> oh okay well stay on solo mode hold on okay Last, you're gonna show all right there's a sure. bunch of dry fucking betting on my stuff and i just got it all over my computer <laughs> let me grab another super arctic lucy i have one in the other room my um have you noticed that after a couple years they started getting a little more yellowish tints on their dorsal area and stuff like that um, yeah, yeah. Um, some of my adult Lucy's have like almost uh, like an off like color to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and some even get some concentration of some pigment cells that uh, are able to synthesize and they're usually form into little um, form of like little orange splotches. Mm -hmm. And so like I have a couple and it always seems to be my females like I have like a couple adult Lucy females that have like one or two little orange paradox spots on their back. So I'll Maybe, let me and then that. I guess have you noticed that in the super arctics or there's none of that happening? In the no, no, no. Oh, when I was talking about the paradoxes on the regular, yeah. that's just a regular Lucy with no arctic. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's a Lucy, but then when you're adding arctic and super arctic, it's probably not happening, correct? Yeah, no, I haven't like with the super arctic Lucy's. Yeah, that that's probably gonna um, null that uh, those yeah. concentrations of the um, you know earth or force that are able to concentrate in areas that kind of like wipes that I think you know possibility out. But there has been some paradox Lucy's that have some melanin 
And it'd be interesting to see how that would look in a superarctic blue sea because superarctic actually um, accelerates melanophores. So it's possible it might actually increase it a little bit or make it. Uh, that's the one thing I was hoping. That is the one thing that I was not really banking on because leucistic is a, definitely a strong trait where it you know, keeps chromatophores from being able to synthesize. So I figured I was like, well, superarctic accelerates um, you know, melanophores. So I was hoping that that could possibly override the Lucy and you might actually get some pigmentation showing up. And I kind of always thought that there would be some translucent qualities to the throat because I'm like, well, these are, this is a changing the iridophores. And this doesn't have anything to do with the um, chromatophores. But it's possible, too, that the Lucy may have interfered or overrode the superarctic Lucy or say, sorry, just the superarctic and then kept that superarctic um, mutation of iridophores from showing up but i didn't think it would because especially in axolotls they were actually able to um they have a gene that actually removes iridophores and it actually looks different in the, the lucies but anyway let me get another super arctic leucistic all right guys i mean you guys can already see we're, we're seeing some great hog noses i was really excited for this one um because I know Jeff always has some great stuff to show us. Blue tongue, super arctic Lucy, whole microzone. For sure, man. For sure. That's for me. This the the Lucy gene is definitely a down the road thing. Um, but um, yeah, but that super arctic looks beautiful. Ricky, one, or just one child, they go for a good price. <laughs> <laughs> all right solo real quick okay try to get his head closer to the camera oh wow yeah he looks like he's wearing some blush there yeah and you can yeah, see cool. on his underside too he's got that same kind of calicoing but he has way less of those white spots showing up yeah, it's, it's, he's almost translucent, man. Yep, pretty much. Diaridophores yeah. actually allow more light waves to kind of go into the scales mm -hmm. and bounce around. And so then you get, and even the belly is just clear and opaly looking. Mm -hmm. And this guy, the one thing that's unique about him is he actually has, it's really tiny, you probably won't see it. He actually has one little white scale on his neck over here. It's really small. You can't really yeah, see it. It's hard it. to catch, yeah. Yeah, but they're way more. If you put a regular Lucy next to them, the regular Lucy looks more of like kind of a flat paper white, and these guys look more of like a pale kind of like uh, transparent pinkish white. And so again, it affects their all their scales. That's really nice. That's really nice. Yeah, then you got the solid black so, guy. Are you producing more this year? You said right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got a few Arctic. I got an Arctic down there. Pass that Lucy. That's gravid. And she was bred by him. Um, and I got like one other right now. No, it's not going to be money. It's not going to be money. I have another Arctic Passat Lucy female here that has pulled out of brumation later than the other females. And she's in shed right now. So as soon as she sheds out, I'm going to be pairing her. And, uh, and, you know, they're always very receptive once they come out of brumation and they've gone through a shed cycle. So, uh, you know, shed cycle early on after being pulled out of brumation. Yeah. So I got her twice. And after her second meal, she went into shed. So I was getting ready to pair her. And as well, now that she's in shed, I'm just going to pair her, you know, once she sheds out. That's really cool, man. <clears throat> so what, what, did, what was your, you know, because you have to be super proud about, like, producing the Super Arctic. What was your thoughts when you, just the plain Super Arctic, when you saw that come out? That uh, I was pretty excited. I was pretty taken aback. I didn't think I was going to hatch that from breeding two of them together. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, actually, the initial female that was bred to one of my Arctic males, I didn't even know she was an Arctic because she had lemon ghost in there. And the lemon ghost was kind of masking the Arctic, mm -hmm. um, you know, phenotype there. And so she looked just kind of more lemon ghosty. And then, yeah, the first one it hatched out, you know, it hatched out looking like a regular super Arctic. So it was really dark, charcoaly black with like kind of like tiger bars. And I was like, this thing is wild looking. And, um, you know, 
just looking at it too, I was like, I was like, this is crazy. I was like, and I knew that the Arctic trait was, you know, hereditary. So I was like, this has to be, you know, the super form here. So, but you know, it took a few more test readings just to confirm that. Cause even though you, you can know genetics and just, you still have to do more test readings to confirm it regardless of, you know, what, you know. Yeah, man. And then, <clears throat> cause I want to touch this base too, is, you know, I think one, the new, one of the newest morphs out in Hognose is the Swiss chocolate, right? Yes. Um, where, you know, what, what differentiates the chocolate, the Swiss chocolate and then the sable? Um, that's a good question. Let me put this guy back. Okay. And then I'll answer what I think. Guys, also forgot to mention Blue Tonga Reptiles. He has a um, a T-shirt, U.S. Art Florida T-shirt uh, design. I think he's got T-shirts, um, hoodies, and all that stuff. And all the proceeds that when you purchase that are going to U.S. Art Florida. Um, drop the BTR. Drop the link here um, so you can so people can see to buy that per, that um, uh, merchandise that you got for for U.S. Art Florida. Let me get um, a Swiss chocolate out. Okay, cool. And I'll bring that over. Yeah, the Swiss chocolates are on. Um, the cool thing is they're on a completely different loci location of a, you know, where the, where that mutant allele is residing is on a different mm -hmm. location than where sables um, located. So that means when you breed them together, they're not allelic. You won't get a visual. Um, animal breeding a sable to a Swiss, you're just going to get double heterozygous uh, sable Swiss. And let me get like a regular Swiss guy over here. And I'm going to grab this dude because this dude is a pretty good example um, to show you probably some discerning differences. Now, the one thing that is a big difference with the Swiss is they get that much darker um, head mass. Their head pattern is a lot more solid and overall darker. And then with Swiss too, you see a lot of individuals that hatch out, especially the dark ones that are much darker than sables are. Now, Swiss do change as they age, um, kind of similar to sables, but the one thing is sables get progressively darker. I've seen Swiss that hatch out very dark and then they just kind of, uh, their colors develop, but they not so much get darker. They kind of just stay about the same. Now, I'll try to show one thing up close. Let's see if I can get it. But it's more evident in the nape of the necks of some of these Swiss. My lighting in here isn't the best. I should think about that next time when I do these podcasts. And I don't want to <laughs> rough this dude up. I kind of want him to explore and do what he wants to do. All right. See how he has like that more goldish on his neck? Yeah. Now, with the Swiss, I'm seeing more yellow spectrums versus with uh, Sables, you're seeing a lot more greenish. And the greenish is a mix of iridophores and xanthophores and melanophores refracting back some bluish light waves that are, you know, um, corresponding with those, you know, black and yellow pigment cells and making it greenish. While with these guys, I'm seeing a lot more golds and yellows and I'm seeing um, more pixelated pigmentation in their background. And so that's a really big, strong difference I've noticed between them because that's one thing sable doesn't really do and getting animals that have a little more on this yellowish spectrum and then also sometimes overall darkish pigment and a really dark head mass i think definitely differentiates differentiates them quite a bit i think those characteristics are you know definitely something not to like you know to be overlooked i think the swiss are going to be noticeably, uh, you know, different from sable combinations as there's more and more made. And uh, yeah, so, yeah, I think there's definitely a bunch of cool stuff that can be made with Swiss that, you know, some of the combinations, um, especially like albino, are going to look very similar to like that of the sable albinos. But I think other combinations that have overall darker pigmentation, you're going to see the more noticeable differences when comparing them to the sable, you know, counterpart. Yeah, when I when I saw uh, Jules post the uh, Swiss Exantic, you know, I I told myself I have to get a Swiss because that, you know, comparing, you know, a, a Sable Exantic to a Swiss uh, Exantic is totally different. 
You know, you can definitely yeah. tell the difference. I think um, right now is kind of pretty good too. You see on that neck, see how that background in there is like a pretty strong yeah. yellow. Yeah. Um, and even on the sides, see where it's kind of like highlighting right there. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think there's definitely bigger contrast between the background and the 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 patterns. Yeah, there's definitely I think a, a more um, pigment saturated animal overall. Uh, with the Swiss versus the Sables. Mm -hmm. Here's a Swiss Conda. It's got that really dark head. Yeah, man. And you can see that overall body is like a lot darker than, you know, your average Sable Conda. So, yeah, these definitely... Um, do you know a lot of similar stuff that sable does it's definitely you know um a pigment enhancing trait it definitely accelerates you know all the pigment cells you know it makes the black um you know come out more um it also increases the xanthophores and erythrophores uh quite a bit and it definitely changes the structure of diridophores but then you also have the concentration of melanin on the head and you know face pattern of the swiss um and then the, the interesting thing is, is seeing more of the yellow pigmentation and uh, some of this, like, um, I think I, this one guy I have over here is actually probably better to show the difference. Yeah, so this is a lighter Swiss male. And check out his neck. Oh yeah, there's definitely you could definitely tell that gold, yeah, that gold color on that neck. It's really interesting. Yeah, so this is a lighter one, and the cool thing is, is like since this one's lighter, it just you know, of course, has less black pigment cells, it has less melanin force, but it gives you an idea of what's going on underneath, and it's got this kind of like sharp yellowish um you know contrast goldish contrast in the background and some nice shadows. what do the bellies look like on those you know they look similar to that of sables actually i think sables actually have cooler bellies <laughs> very small checkering though yeah some do um i have other ones i can show you uh examples of Here's a larger individual. This one's a little older. And this one kind of has like, you know, just kind of standard black, kind of shiny belly, similar to that of the yeah. sable. But the um, checkering is kind of like a olive greenish. Mm -hmm. It's coming out a little more yellow on the camera, but it's kind of like this olive greenish, kind of yellowish um, looking person. Beautiful man. So, you know, and for myself, this is the first time I've seen so many uh, cho Swiss chocolates, you know, um, that somebody's sharing. Um, you know, are you, you know, and, you know I'm going to bring it up. I got a head Swiss from you. Are you producing a lot more this year that you're going to be releasing to the general public? What, what's your, where you're at with the Swiss chocolates? Um, yeah, hopefully. I don't think I'm going to produce a ton this season. We'll see how it goes. Um, you know, I got some Swiss females still in brumation and those will probably get bred more in like the end of May. I'd like to breed them sooner, but, uh, my schedule is just kind of pushing me to breed them like a little later. Uh, yeah. but you know, I'll see how, I mean, I don't have like a ton of these things, but you know, I should have some to sell for sure, but there's a good decent amount of interest because, you know, people like hognose snakes, to simply put it, but yeah. I'm, I'll, I'll well, show you, show the, yeah. The Swiss, the head Swiss female I have from you. Um, okay. Yeah, let's see how she's doing. She has good size. Yeah, man. She, she's uh, definitely doing really good. Put myself on solo mode here. There we go. 
Oh yeah. And she's really nice, man. Like that, she has really high whites. You know, and she's starting to get a, um, you know, like between a little bit of greenish. It's beautiful. Yeah, I'm really excited for this project. Yeah, that belly. Look at that belly. But she's doing good, man. Great eater. Um, you know, I haven't had any problems with her eating. She's grown. I think she's had like two sheds already. Here. Yeah, no, well, that's good. Yeah, she's at that size too, where they really start to take off because she's like probably she's eating fuzzy mice, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you got like one of my last like pet Swiss females. Like, you know, I don't really, I don't want to sell anymore. Uh, but yeah, hopefully, like, I, I just, I bred some uh, hex recently. I have one Swiss female that got bred um, a couple weeks ago, and I think I have like six het to het pairings. So you know, that will be fun. But you know, so a lot of those involved conda. So I should have like more Swiss and Swiss conda. So I uh, had a question about the gloves changes. Is critical? Is it just caution? Oh, uh, yeah, it's a precautionary thing. It's definitely something to be in the habit of because you don't want to get in the habit of just touching everything. Now, my only animals I have to actually be concerned with are the ones out in my quarantine room um, away from everything else. And in those, I'm doing quite a few glove changes. I'm basically doing glove changes between any animals um, that are from, like, different people or, you know, what? I, let's say I have hognose from, like, two breeders, and mm -hmm. I have them – in the same rack, but I'll have like a big space to ones that are higher up and then ones that are lower. The ones that are higher up are the ones that I'm assessing as lower risk of the individual I'm buying from and kind of watch their habits of what they buy and what they, you know, how big their collection is, a, a bunch of things like that. And so I'll change gloves between them. But when I'm working with my main stuff, generally we try to do well, the goal is to change gloves, be between every rack system that way if there ever is a problem you can isolate it and you know where it's at versus like if you're just touching everything and there's a problem it's like well now you touched everything and you don't know what's safe and what's not so when we do glove changes between every single rack system um but you know there's certain areas like for for anybody helping me they have to change gloves every single rack um when it's me working on my stuff every now and then if i know it's like hey these are you know two of my course racks in a row um, I'll go between and, and touch animals, um, yeah. you know, sometimes, but when it comes to quarantine, like I'm the only one that works in my quarantine. I, it's very rare. I have anybody else work in those. Cause I want to know how things are being handled, touched. And, you know, if I have just somebody else in there, I'm like, I don't know what this person's touching. When did you start that, um, big, you know, quarantine separation between your main collection and when you brought it, bring it in? Probably about six years ago. Um, and what that really started with was, um, people talking about cryptosis and hognose snakes. And if you would have asked me eight years ago, I would have said hognose can't get cryptosis because cryptosis is generally very species specific. It has a difficult time jumping hosts, despite what veterinarians will tell you. Um, the generalized consensus there is it's highly contagious and it can pretty much jump to every species, but that's not the case. Cause if it was, you'd be seeing this in crested geckos, gargoyles, this stuff is extremely contagious very easy to pass on. Um, it's very cryptic. That's why it gets the name cryptosis. Um, but yeah, and it kept happening more and more. I heard more and more people saying like, hey, this guy has cryptosis. And then I was like, I think they have like, you know, I was like, I thought it was something else and they were just misidentifying it. And then people started showing me lab reports. And then I bought some hognose from some people that were in my quarantine and stuff. And it's like, this stuff had cryptosis. And it was surprising the people I was buying it from. Now it seems to be getting a lot better. Um, the trend of using gloves and quarantining has definitely been catching on. Um, the definite, oh, the, the, the one problem that I still see is I'd say the majority of people are kind of, um, even though they probably don't see themselves as this way, they kind of, I'd say, have the, um, the mindset of, I'll, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. Because I see some of these people's quarantine processes and I'm like, if they knew what this stuff does and how it works, they would be quarantining differently. For sure, man. Yeah. No, I think that's very important. You know, quarantining, no matter who you're getting from, quarantining, um, because it's not just crypto that you got to worry about. Uh, 
you know, mites, um, yeah, bacteria, sure, parasites, you know, like, um, you know, it, it all depends. And it all depends, too, on wh how the previous keeper is um, is maintaining their cleanliness, too. Because it might not be crypto, but, hey, if, if the animal hasn't been clean and is sitting in their own, you know, feces for a while, there is going to be bacteria buildup. And they can ingest it and get sick and basically pass it on, you know, if you're not using gloves or just bare handling all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Bacterial bacterial infections um, uh, definitely are, hogs are more susceptible to bacteria than other species. They're definitely sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, and it's, it's, it's definitely contagious. It's more of like a slow contagion. Um, mm -hmm. Most of them can be resolved as antibiotics while cryptosis has no cure. And, um, you know, sometimes your bodies can fight off bacterial infections, too. But, yeah, that's definitely one to pay, like, uh, to, you know, definitely quarantine, um, you know, because of th that's, an, uh, you know, an other possible yeah. sickness, too. Yeah. Sometimes like you said, you know, bacteria can be, um, what's it called, cured. But can you imagine a large collection, the money you're going to spend, yeah. the headaches, well, the, it's just... Yeah. Yeah, the other thing is, too, the antibiotics aren't good. You don't want to just use antibiotics as, like, hey, I don't have to clean my stuff really well because I can just use antibiotics. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that. I actually have a bunch of health problems from taking antibiotics or from getting gastrointestinal infections um, multiple times because once I got one, it made me more susceptible to getting more. And, yeah, the, the antibiotics aren't good. And with reptiles, it's going to be even tougher to resolve issues if you do get into that corner of over antibiotic um, your animals or over providing antibiotics to your collection because you can kill off necessary uh, gut flora that's going to be very hard to replace. And so, yeah, it's not something you just want to use as a, you know, fail safe. And, you know, the thing there I say is keeping clean water bowls and good, you know, ventilation. Air quality is very important. If you have really good airflow, that's why I have exhaust fans in my place. I definitely encourage people to use rack systems that have more circulation. If they don't have much circulation, get fans, add that circulation to your room. And then large standing water bowls, I really don't like because water is your number one source for bacteria to grow. And hognose are not only susceptible to outside build up of bacteria, really they're the most susceptible to their own bacteria because that's the bacteria they're often getting exposed to through their stool um, right. and then drinking back washing water. And then that water sitting there for three or four or five days, coming back and drinking more. Um, so those are the bacterial issues there. And then things like nematodes, those are like very tough. That is like, I don't know if you can quarantine from it. You really just have to worm your stuff if it has nematodes because that stuff can like the roundworm eggs can live at like, you can live like, I think three years outside of a host. It's like worse than cryptosis as far as being able to live. Nematodes aren't really super serious. They're mostly benign. They're not completely benign. They definitely do have a negative effect, but it's uh, very uh, minute and it can be easily fixed with panic here if that is the case. But don't just okay. panic here your stuff. Take out stool samples, send them to the veterinarian. Uh, nematodes are very easy to find. You know, have you gotten lucky and been able to find a good vet in your area and stuff like that? Or like, are you at no. this point? No. Okay. <laughs> at this point, you, it's just trial by fire, you know, learning from the years of experience. Yeah. On how to treat your animals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was like the thing when because I was getting wild. I got a lot of hogs with nematodes and bacterial infections originally, and that's how I learned all of this stuff. Um, you know, I mean, if you're not being told it, you can't just learn this stuff like you know overnight. Um, you know, if anybody knows how to do stuff right away, it's like somebody's telling them. Um, it took me like 10 years to figure all this stuff out, and you know, I'd have stuff sent out to vets and labs, and it'd be like, all oh, your stuff's fine, like, not the stuff that I got isn't fine, and um. You know, you basically just had to keep pursuing. Then you had to tell them what to kind of actually test and look for. I do have a pretty good vet now, but he's not an exotic vet. You know, he's does his best. Um, but really, it's kind of like you have to be your own advocate. And that's kind of like even mm -hmm. with my own situation with having ulcerative colitis due to taking an too many antibiotics and wiping out my gut flora. I was able to do more with just researching online and finding out other things people have done and just using logic versus just going to doctors and like, Hey, we'll just give you this. This helps inflammation. And that's all they're prescribing yeah. you. You know, it's interesting you say that, man. Um, because our family, we do jujitsu and stuff like that. And there's this big jujitsu guy that had the same situation. Like he had a dropout of like, and he's like number one pound for pound guy. 
because of taking a whole bunch of antibiotics because they had gotten uh, staph infections, reoccurring staph. And um, mm. this guy, you know, he had a, a lot of issues. And I think like last year, after like three years of dealing with it, finally found a doctor, I think somewhere in California that um, is helping him with that stuff. Yeah, it's so, good. But yeah, yeah, sometimes, yeah, it's because then like, you know, there's things that can be repercussions too. Because if you don't get it fixed right away, the longer it goes on and the more wrong medications you take, there is more mm. damage that's, um, you know, some stuff can be managed or repaired, but you're never going to be back to 100% to what yeah. you used to be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, that being said, like, I don't think, you know, it's better to keep your collection clean and quarantine than, like yeah. you said, you know, just nuking it with, um, antibiotics because it's yeah the antibiotics a... are bad don't just start giving your stuff random antibiotics all the time it's like the livestock industry does it and it's like you know that's because they keep the stuff in close quarters and you know most of these animals too like the chickens their longevity there is like six months it's like we want to keep our hog nose around here longer than that we're not treating them like livestock now there is definitely interesting things to learn from the livestock industry um in any of these industries and i've actually paid attention to that but you know, air circulation, good air circulation, clean water bowls, you know, clean your enclosures, and you don't really have to worry about that stuff at all. And if it does occur, and you do have to give your stuff antibiotics for whatever reason, um, just keep it really clean from then there and out, and then you don't have to worry about having to redo that again. But yeah, it's definitely um, not something you want to rely on, in my yeah, opinion. Yeah. yeah. So... Jeff, if you had a re if you were starting hog noses today with the genetics that we have and stuff like that, what would be your first pair you bought? Ooh, first pair I bought. I don't think it would really matter though, because I think I'd be buying a bunch more pairs weeks later and some might be <laughs> more important. But if I was to look at something like really important, if I was starting right now with new hog nose and I need and is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um yeah. Well, the one thing is I'd have to try to find a trusted person. Like, all right, this person's collection is most likely clean. Um, first things to start out with, that's a tough one because I know the answer you're looking for. Because you want to know project. What project would I start out with? I'd probably start with Swiss. You know, that's, that's, that's a good, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think I'd start with Swiss and then I'd start buying a bunch of other stuff. It's not that I would like, you know, I'm still doing a lot of stuff with Sable. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Sable still like, we're so intertwined and deep into that project. There's no way I'd ever even suggest abandoning Sable for Swiss, um, even though there's probably going to be other different cool looking things in Swiss with these combinations. There's still a lot of stuff that can be made with Sables and there's, a lot more availability with Sables and further along projects to, you know, sure. um, you know, proceed with these the goals that you may want to achieve with like, you know, certain uh, morphs together. So, you know, but yeah, I start with Swiss. It's a good one, man. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That's uh, like, I, I think Swiss, we definitely have um, a, a large upside on what we, what's coming up, coming um, to fruition here in the next couple of years, you know, was it last, this past year? Jules just dropped so many different stuff to the public that it was pretty crazy to see. Yeah, yeah, you got a little bit of everything over there, but that's like that's mm -hmm. his main thing is Swiss. So you know he's pretty much just doing Swiss and then with other uh, combos. But you know, luckily, I mean, he's not like mass producing them or anything like that. So his collection is like sizable, but it's not anything where it's like you know he's overdoing it. From what I see, yeah. everything looks very good. And if you if now if you had to recommend one single product reptile or you know product that you use for your hog nose, what would it be? Mm, a product. Um, could, could it be anything like bedding stuff like that. Anything, anything yeah, anything bedding, feed, cow, you know, supplements, whatever. Yeah, it is. I mean, I would suggest supplementing. I really like the idea of supplementing because that bolsters the immune system and that helps things with like you know bacteria and stuff like that. Um, you know, I like, like Zumed calcium and Reptivite's good. Um, also Vionate and Osteoform SA. Vionate's of, you know, vitamin supplementation for, you know, small animals, pets, exotics. You know, so, yeah, I'd also suggest probably like a good pair of nitrile gloves, you know. Um, I know you said <laughs> one, but I just start selecting like, I like it's fine, man. Yeah. 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 Coarse Aspen Sandy chips, although these damn pj murphy people make it hard to find man 
I think somebody needs to start a manufacturing. Some, some reptile person needs to start manufacturing their own. <laughs> that one. Yeah. Course, but see, yeah. they, they usually all these you just go to your feed mill and ask if they can get the course. They mainly get the regular kind, and some people even buy the courses and they still send them the regular kind. But I like that for a form of aspen. Um, and then you know, too, like, I'm not against like bioactive though. I love bioactive substrate. Um, you know, it's a little more involved because you got to make sure, um, you know, it keeps the proper moisture levels and stuff to a degree. I mean, sometimes it's okay to let some of it dry up, but. You know, the coarse aspen sandy chips is just very easy to keep the animals uh, sanitary and it's easy to switch out and clean and cheap. Um, you know, so I like it for that because, like, as far as keeping animals happy and healthy, a lot of it's keeping things clean. So that's why I like the coarse aspen sandy chips. Very easy to change out um, and keep things sterile. Very easy to observe, too, if it gets dirty. Um, so, yeah. And then what's, here's another one, like what's, uh, like throughout all the years, what you have, like you said, you started 13, so you have like 20 years or something around that? Well, yeah. Hog noses? yeah, I'm 35, right? I'll be 36 okay. later. So yeah, I mean, I got my first hog nose when I was nine, I hatched out my first ones when I was 11. By the time I was 13, you know, I had like, I probably actually, because like, I said I had like, had like four or five really, but I, I think I saw the notebook from 2000, I do, from 2001. And so I would have been, um you know, um, third, well, if it was two, yeah, I would have been probably, if it started this, uh, winter, spring, I would have been 13 going on 14. And I think at that time, I, I think I had like six hog nose. Um, I'm not sure if I include the thing with that is I didn't include all my hog nose. Cause I think there were some, there was definitely some babies too. And I didn't include those. I just kind of had so that for through all that time period. What was the most challenging thing you've had to deal with breeding the hog noses and just take care of them? Well, early on, it really was the, the, the toughest because there's nobody, like, I kept getting, like, hog nose with bacterial infections and hog nose with, like, you know, that were just not doing good, wild caught stuff. Some of it didn't do the best, um, you know, and, you know, nobody to help you with any of it. So it took me until, like, you know, I was, like, 20 to realize, like, a lot of this stuff was associated with bacterial infections. And once my collection was cleaned, then I didn't have to really worry about anything. But until then, like, you know, most of the stuff like sepsis just went under the radar because it wouldn't show up in, um, you know, any necropsies or any um, fecal tests or anything like that. Uh, at least the way that these uh, labs were testing for, you know, um, anything. But, you know, that overall was probably the toughest um, because, you know, I'm taking care of these animals and not realizing what's happening to them. And, it's just very frustrating and you know i'd save up 500 bucks which would take me forever spend it and they'd be like yeah your stuff's fine it's all healthy i'm like no it's not i'm like this animal <laughs> you're probably feeding it too large of meals and i'm like this thing is like yeah you know, like this big and it's eating large pinks and it can't hold them down i said like, there's something wrong with these animals and you know none of those animals back then had cryptosis and so that's the thing that again why i was so surprised that cryptosis they actually i mean i shouldn't be that surprised because that's the one thing with cryptosis is definitely never underestimate it and that's one problem people try to do with it they well they don't try to underestimate it but they try to put a label on it like hey it acts like this this has it this doesn't have it this is that and it's like that's not a good way to look at it this stuff is extremely tricky and i know that from working with leopard and african fat tail geckos for so long because they uh carry cryptosis in the wild and so watching it um and them and getting it in the quarantine sections and seeing what it can do and see how it can behave it's very 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 difficult to, well actually it's kind of easy pr to predict because it's just an odd uh, there's just a spectrum from where it's completely um asymptomatic and they're not even the animals not even hardly shedding off osis and the animals testing negative but they're throwing false negatives all the way to completely breaking out with it and having debilitating symptoms and there's everything in between so yeah, but yeah. that yeah, but it doesn't answer the question like, hey, it's like for certain people, they want to be like, hey, it behaves like this only. It's like, no, it behaves in a whole array of ways from nothing to everything. And I guess that's another reason why it makes it so difficult to, you know, contain it, to deal with it and stuff like that because yeah, you just don't know, really. Yep. Yeah. All right, man. Man, we got uh, two hours in and I think we can probably go another hour. Um <laughs> But I know you, like you said, you got back this morning from your show. Um, you know, what, what's your next show? If people, uh, you have another city. show coming up? 
Yeah, Salt Lake City, May 6th and 7th. Um, so, yeah, that'll be probably my last show for a while. I might do another one in July. I got to see what my schedule's like with breeding and everything. Generally, I kind of take off most of the summer because it's nice weather in Ohio. And, you know, you only get so many days to enjoy it. But I'm also mainly focusing on breeding and, you know, just getting my, you know, breeders, making sure that they're well taken care of. And I'm pretty much checking in on them multiple times throughout the day and then especially when they're laying eggs so generally through summer and fall i'm not doing really any shows like i always do tinley i've been doing tinley for ever since i was 16. so actually this october um will be my 20th year vending to tinley um reptile expo but yeah those are my next two that are definitely coming up far apart may 6th may 7th uh, salt lake and then the uh, october early october tinley and i may do one um in july but i gotta see I'll probably end up doing the one in July, but my dad will end up going with me on that one because he's not going to turn down a free trip hanging out with me. <laughs> that's cool, man. And, and I see when you post that your dad's always traveling and stuff like that. That's pretty cool to have that connection. I think the reptile, you know, throughout, you know, you becoming an adult has definitely kept you guys closer, it seems like. it. Yeah. Um, you know, we do. We, we used to fish all the time together. We did bass tournaments and stuff. Um he doesn't own any animals anymore. He does his crazy artwork stuff. Um, but, you know, he lives really clean. He lives five minutes down the road. So, you know, he stops in and visits a lot, you know, especially the days when there's, like, a lot of activity here. When we have a, uh, I have a lot of friends over here helping, working on stuff. Um, it's a lot more interesting because there's a lot of uh, – Leslie and I always go back and forth, and so there's always a lot of uh, fun conversations here. So, Enchanted, you said you had a question. Just post it in the comments. I'll ask them before uh, we close out. Um, you know, if anybody else has another couple questions that maybe we didn't cover and you guys want, we're waiting for this live to ask them. Go ahead and post them. We'll, you know, we'll get him going again. <laughs> yeah, I'm still, I'm still waiting on one egg from this female. So I said she had like two or three more, but it looks like she has only uh, two, two more. Well, I just pulled one, so it looks like she's, she's going to lay ten eggs. But it looks like she had 100% fertility because the last egg I'm presuming is uh completely fertile based on the size of the bulge in her body i guess she's saying where's my snakes <laughs> oh yeah let me um uh-oh was i supposed to ship today <laughs> oh geez because i send myself notes yeah a to-do list to so you won't forget yeah Sometimes I forget to write in the list, though. All right. Check on on hog. Check on Chanted Hogs. <laughs> All right. All right. I'm not seeing a date. Hold on. <laughs> Can I shift? Said two two Arctic lavender albino. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah I know, but I'm 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 seeing if I can ship tomorrow. Nice. That, that's a that's a hell of a pair right there. Yeah, there's that there's another snake in there too. Yeah. Okay. Now one sable head albino. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I can good ship way tomorrow. to get his attention on, on the live. <laughs> oh yeah, you know there's been times too like recently because like you know there's just so much stuff going on where like you know that's happened recently I, I hate doing it but yeah i've definitely of course make mistakes where i'm writing because i have a notebook and i write out a schedule and every now and then you know there's like a shipment that you know ends up getting missed because i overlooked the date or whatever so i was hoping i was like man i was like I'm, i try to like make sure that doesn't happen i've been good about it lately i was like did i do it again <laughs> so jeff i'm gonna have two last questions before we uh finish as where do you think you see yourself and then the hog nose community within the next like five years? Probably all breeding hog nose and happy that we have hog nose snakes. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll probably be further along in projects. Um, you know, part of my life with hog nose snakes, I'm sure will be relatively similar, but just with more projects. I also plan to put an addition on my place. And uh, yeah, that's, and I think the hog nose communities going to start, um, you know, on its own path of something similar to that of other large reptile communities, um, you know, because there is a lot more people involved 
there's a lot more um, just presence on other social media platforms. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's going to continue to grow. Um, I think there's going to be a point where the growth isn't going to be as substantial because we've seen a really big uptick, of course, due to COVID and then, you know, uh, just social media in general being a really good um, promoter and advertiser for, you know, these snakes. But, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, you see how big the ball python, you know, market got. The hog nose market, you know, is going to be I very close to second to that because there are definitely a, uh, hog nose are more popular in other countries than ball pythons in certain aspects. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, are more commonly kept, and as new hog nose morph combinations come out, and there's just more excitement for them, which there's always been that kind of like snowballing. Yeah, I think it's you know things are going to be in a good position in five years from now. I do see there's going to be probably a, um, a slowdown in lower end hog nose and probably there might be some, uh, you know, price drops uh, coming there just as more and more people produce hog nose. Because the one thing is since the hog nose market is so strong it unfortunately attracts um, greed and greed will definitely have an impact on it. And uh, it's not going to be the best impact. I don't, it's not going to decimate anything. It's definitely, not going to be anything that I would really worry about strongly, but it definitely will appear here very soon. I agree, man. I agree. That's pretty cool. And, and like you said, man, I think we definitely have the potential to be up there like close second to the ball Python community. And I'm seeing a lot of ball Python people dipping their toe into the hog nose uh, breedings too. Yeah, um, that's good and bad. Some ball Python people, cause like, yeah, they just stay away. Just so you get into hog nose because you like hog nose snakes. You yeah. know, that's why that's one thing I really like. The one the big thing that promotes hog nose is, you know, like there's like the Galaxy Exotics. I, I forget like how many. I think they have like three million followers on TikTok. And they just post silly videos of hog nose snakes. And so that's gonna attract the crowd of people that just think hog nose are a fun species and they're cute. Mm -hmm. And you know, hopefully these people are getting into it for the right reason. They want a really cool pet. And, you know, and I see more and more people caring about the well-being of their snake, um, which is good. You know, even when I see people anthropomorphize stuff where they think like Hulk action figures and shit look good in their hog nose enclosure. And they over, I'm like, here's the thing, even though a lot of this stuff is unnecessary and isn't doing anything, I'm like, at least I know the person cares about the animal, yeah, you know? Yeah. So if somebody's like dressing up their hog nose, just as long as they're not stressing it out, they want to put a hat on every now and then. I don't care. I know the person's taking good care of it, you know, but then there's some people that want to be critical and like, don't put a little ball cap on your hog nose. Snake. It can't like that. It's like this thing doesn't know. It could have been a leaf on its head for whatever. This is as long as you're not like pinning down your hog nose and restraining it and doing dumb shit, putting it in like little toy Corvettes and making it go off ramps. Just don't go that far. Um, but you know, it's good to see more and more people caring about, you know, reptiles and snakes. And yeah, one of the, best ways to do that is through posting cutesy stuff actually and so that's why i kind of even do it because some of the stuff i post you know in the past i'm like oh, this is a little cringy but i'm still gonna do it <laughs> that's right man yeah yeah you know getting i think a hog nose is i mean to us when we might be partial to it right you know yeah the per perfect pet you know to to keep they're smaller size they're you know diurnal so you can deal with them during the day when we're up you know, so yeah, yeah, the thing was, is, if you start talking about all the pros about hog nose snakes, you know, we sound a little biased, but at the same time, we got a lot of evidence <laughs> to back it up. That's the problem. You can't be biased if you have enough right. evidence. There's a lot of it's evidence true. there. You know, That's it's true, all like yeah. true statements. You know, like I could, I wouldn't mind arguing as a ball python breeder why hog nose are better. I don't think it would be a hard one to win. I do like ball pythons. I love ball pythons. Yeah. I like the genetics aspect. Um, that community has actually done a lot for the reptile industry as a whole um, as far as getting people involved in it. I mean, if there was no ball python industry, there'd be no hog nose market. 100%, yeah. Um, yeah. And they are cool snakes. I just don't like the mass exportation of them out of Africa going into, like, mostly being imported in Florida. And, you know, it's because of the demands there. But the thing is, if that stopped, the lower end ball python morphs that are being produced would have a place to go. They would have, you know, more places to go and hopefully get them into better homes versus just having this little over, 
you know, saturation because I'm more marketed like 40,000 of them. It's like, okay, these things aren't selling right away. But if all of a sudden they stopped importing 10, 20, 30,000 at a time, you know, out of Africa, that would number would end up uh, taken from that other number. Um, and so we don't need these. So I actually blame Florida Fish and Wildlife because they have to okay it through CITES and CITES are supposed to monitor stuff. So Florida Fish and Wildlife is dropping the ball again. They just dropped it and uh, it's all Just add that. another X to their, to their yeah. list of... <laughs> yeah, for things that they failed at. It's like you guys are supposed to be monitoring their numbers. You're just looking at, okay, 20,000, bring them in. It's like the paperwork looks good. It's like, how about no? Yeah, and, and I've heard that a lot, you know, talking about just, um, you know, slowing down the importation, you know, from, from Africa into the U.S. And, and yeah, making, you, you know, just growing our own U.S. population of uh, captive bred uh, ball pythons. Yeah, you, you said you've been hearing that more and more? I have, I have, yeah. Good. I've been hearing it's, it from, it's from the ball python community. It's weird. Florida Fish and Wildlife says everybody wants to take things from the wild. I wonder why that seems to also be wrong information that they're peddling. It's almost yeah, sounds like think about it. Like, community sound like we're only yeah. interested in more illegal stuff when actually we're not. Very I'm interesting. Saying, you got to think about Florida it. How many more are there in ball pythons? Like, I think there's world first being created a handful of them every year because of just the quantity of morphs there is yeah. and combos that it can be created right like there's so many worlds first most of the time the people hatching them probably don't even know their worlds first they 100%. wouldn't even know how would you even know you could hatch out five worlds first and you would be completely oblivious to it mm -hmm. you'd have no idea you'd be like i got these cool ball python morphs three years later you find out their worlds first actually at that point you'd be like okay that's fine yeah. You know, yeah. not as exciting. Just, there's a lot of them. I mean, it's a good accomplishment when you make a really cool morph combination. So I'm not trying to take away from that. It sounds like I'm being kind of negative on the ball pythons, but I'm not, I think. You know, you brought up a, a good thing about like normal ball pythons. And have you, and then going back to the hog nose, do you still breed pet only like single gene animals or, you know, um, wild type? stuff or are all your stuff you're breeding have at least pet for something most of my stuff's morphed i don't really have many wild types anymore i do have one wild type female um in my quarantine and i do have some like wild types that they're polygenic you know so they're not really wild mm -hmm. type actually because they've been their wild types have been manipulated to not even look like a wild type um i have very few and the one of the reasons is because i have so many projects i don't just want to overdo it with lower end stuff um, there is one thing um, I do like about producing higher end animals is most like almost everybody I deal with is a pretty serious person when it comes to taking care of them. When I have people asking, what's your cheapest hog nose? Sometimes those people uh, from certain experiences I've had, they're trying to get everything at the bare minimum and they're putting less effort into the animal. And now I don't want to, that's definitely not everybody because everybody has their you know different things they can afford and finances some of these people are younger they don't have yeah. a lot of access a lot of money they don't want to you know it, it might be hard for them to come up with 500 bucks so they don't want to buy a 500 dollars hog nose because they'd love a hundred dollar hog nose just as much and that's great um and so you know i do produce some stuff for a couple hundred bucks and everything and you know i've there's a lot of people that come to reptile shows and they're showing me their enclosures and they're interested in taking very good care of them. But when you have animals that are a little more expensive, like, you know, in a few hundred dollar range, it definitely, you know, I definitely, I probably see more of the problem, you know, over these years of people buying stuff really like, you know, around 150 bucks, hundred bucks and lower. Cause you know, they're like, oh, I got 30 bucks and they're buying it more on an impulse and a whim. And that's not good because when you're buying a pet, you know, or even for a breeding project, it shouldn't be on impulse or whim. You know, and if it is, make sure, you know, it's something that you, you know, want to stay committed to and really going to enjoy. Because, like, I just bought a beaded lizard. It was kind of an impulse, you know, not realizing, like, man, these are cool. I was like, you know, I was like, I don't know much about them. And I got to hold one. And I was like, yeah, these are neat. And I was like, you know, the care is really easy. And they're telling me how they feed them. And I was like, you know what? I think I could do really well with these as far as taking care of them. I don't know about breeding them. But I was like, let me get one and see how it goes. And we'll go from there. But then, you know, you, 
your experience keeper from, you know, you had, like you said, you have geckos, you've bred geckos, yeah. you have snakes. So it's not just somebody walking off the street and picking up a random, you know, like going to a show and picking up a beaded, a beaded um, lizard and not knowing anything about it. Yeah, you have right. have a, right. a base. Yeah. Already. Yeah, and, it, like, and I talked to him for a while, and I've been doing research and stuff. Um, although it's like it's like I may think one part of me is like I'm like I gotta really pay attention to my hog and stuff going on. I gotta stop looking at pictures of beaded lizards and like reading about them because I gotta do a <laughs> bunch of stuff. But yeah, because that's like I got times, man. I want to get bit by because the more I hear about getting bit by, I'm like man, I definitely don't want to get bit by one. And oh, but come by one other friend, uh, uh, Stephen Cush even said he goes he goes yeah, their venom's pretty bad, man. Because I've heard some horror stories. He goes that being said, he goes. You got to be kind of an idiot to get bit by one. He goes, just don't be stupid and you'll be fine. And he goes, I've never been bit. He goes, I don't plan on getting bit ever. And he goes, just keep them like, you know, away from you. And like when you hold them, flat hand them, just be really conscious of them and all that. And the babies I know are bad, but the adults kind of get real sluggish and slow down. But, you know, another thing is, too, you just don't want to completely trust the animal and just let it crawl all over you or do whatever mm -hmm. it wants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, you know, talking about like price range of hognose, stuff like that, what, what are your thoughts about and people, you know, maybe buying certain projects and then like turning around and dropping the price so they're more accessible to more people? What are your thoughts on that? It all depends on how it's done. Um, you know, I've seen some belligerently just like stupid stuff where it's just like, you know, um, prices are just like posted like hey like it was one point arctic females you know a couple of years ago easy five six hundred bucks for regular arctic female and they were pretty much selling out more market some person just went up there and put them up for 250 bucks and you know that's just kind of like i don't know why they did it may have just been a lack of understanding of what's going on in the market um so it may not necessarily have been something you know it wasn't you know probably ill intent or, you know, something that was actually stupid is just probably just not really being aware. It's like, oh, I produced these um, and I'm just going to sell them for this or whatever. But, you know, they sold right away. And then, you know, the next Arctics that were posted weeks later were, you know, five and six hundred dollars and they all sold, too. But, you know, it depends on how it's done. Um, you know, it, it'd be a tough one to do. Like, let's say if somebody's like, I'm going to buy Swiss chocolate and I'm just going to I just want to make them accessible to everybody uh like at a really cheap price you know for one they'd have to invest a lot and then they just have to start doing all this work and effort and using their own time to just purposely sell them for less which would seem like it's almost got some form of a spiteful or vindictive intent because i've seen that actually a little bit not with but with basically price comparisons like somebody's behind on a project but they're starting to produce them they see other people are selling them and there's only one breeder I've seen do this. And they try to make look everybody else look better. I'm not going to charge this much. These people are price gouging when mine are available. In one or two years, they're going to be this price. And it didn't even make any sense. Their price wasn't even that much lower. And it's like, well, that's what the price is already going to be probably in two years. And then they were also saying that the gene was weak and that these people are selling them weren't like, you know, um, um, like, I don't know, like. Just, just trying to make an excuse, like just yeah. trying to, everything under the sun, yeah, yeah to make right. I haven't seen, but you know, yeah. but here's the thing, though. It's like only you don't see that there, but the hardest community is really good. Everybody in it is probably for the most part, like yeah, it's not cutthroat. I haven't seen anything like that. I think in the next few years, you'll see a little bit of that with the just because so many people are trying to produce too many to just it's a, a whole greed factor. But from that, you know, that aside, um. You know, Hogwarts community is like really, really good. Uh, you know, I've been involved, you know, in the leopard and fat tail gecko community um, for a long time. You know, that community's okay. There's definitely there's drama in those ones for sure. Um, you know, ball python community. I haven't been directly involved, but I know a lot of people that are. I've had ball pythons. Um, you know, that community's like you know very large and it's extremely competitive. And so then you'll get issues when things are. You know extremely competitive but hog knows you know the community there's a lot um you know i think a lot of very nice people and a lot i of agree people man are, yeah people are doing it more for the right reasons you know and so these people too are investing like a lot of money like i and they're they don't even really care too much if they get that much of a return and um that might seem kind of like um irresponsible but i think that's a good way to look at it you know as long as you can afford it and it's what you like to do 
and if you finance things um, or, you know, invest, sorry, I should just say invest in these things and you really, really enjoy it, you'll probably end up being successful. You know, the, the money equation is probably the last thing. If you're just focusing on trying to make money, you could be successful, but probably not as much as these others. Yeah. And I, I think that goes for any industry, anything, you know, like if you don't have the passion for it. Eventually you're going to get burn yourself out and you're going to just fall off. You know? Yeah. And that's like, cause there's some people like, you know, like they said, ball, like some of these people breed ball pythons, not all of them, of course. Um, but they're like, yeah, they're like, I keep getting people asking for hognose snakes. So I started, you know, I'm starting to get hognose to breed. So I was like, this person's breeding hognose solely because they see there's a demand. So that's the wrong reason right there. For sure, man. Yeah. All right, Jeff, two and a half hours, man. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty uh, good conversation. Um, my last wrap up question is if you had the attention of the whole world for five minutes, what would you tell them? Oh, man, I didn't think about that answer because I remember you asked Jermaine that. Oh, man, five minutes is a long time to hold people's attention. And I don't think I'm going to be able to change anybody's mind. Most people's minds are pretty much made up about, you know. And you can anything. plant a seed. You can now, plant a seed. I can't what? You can plant a seed of thought in somebody. Oh, I can plant minutes. a seed of thought in anybody's yeah, mind. Yeah. Ooh, that's devious. Ooh, you can do a lot with that. Oh, holy crap. Huh. I don't know. That's a good one, I guess. That's a pretty good question. Because you got to think about but, it. If, if you have the platform of the whole world and they're watching, people are paying attention. Like, okay, why does this guy have this platform and he's about to tell us something? They probably, don't, gonna, think I was a, they probably don't think I was a dick. They look for any excuse not to. Like, Who's this guy telling us what to do? They probably do the opposite. They're like, screw this guy. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I think a lot of the problems in the world start from um basically a young age because it's not like we just you know start out like yeah and this life's tough man i don't know i just tell people you know do your best try not to like do bad stuff to other people that's a tough one for certain people i guess um especially fwc they really struggle with that one so you know i probably want to talk to those people see what i could do with help i don't know i <laughs> i guess There's got to be something maybe like, you know, yeah, we have the FWC or something that you've seen lit lately I within mean, your maybe your own minutes. personal community. Yeah, I got five minutes. So I guess there would be portions where I wouldn't be able to pause for a long time and people could just stare at me like, what is he trying to do? What is he trying to think? <laughs> and then you just pull out a hog nose, you know? I think people, though, <laughs> fundamentally, yeah, just pull out a hog nose. Think this is all you need in your life. Actually, that's the seed I would plant in everybody's mind. It's all you need is hog. And people would be like, trying to sleep they have their pounding headache like, what does he mean just have hog those snakes planted in their mind they're like i don't even like snakes what's going on <laughs> and then uh we'd create one of the largest um economies <laughs> would be owning hog nose it'd be larger than dogs and cats up to right, yeah. would have to completely submit um i guess it would be too much of an ask to try to solve world peace or anything like that so i think you're on the right track of planting the idea of hog nose in people's minds um yeah, five minutes. Yeah, I was like, I don't think I. It's a, it's a, it's a very good question. I like the. It's a very cool, um, you know, hypothetical and philosophical, you know, thing sure, to think man. about. It gets you. It gets you thinking, you know, and and it gets. It's not just you know the easy like you said the easy answer could be like let's all live in peace and harmony, but. They can go into different routes into, you know, hey, if you have a personal agenda, why not use it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like the, yeah. the thing is to solve problems, people got to help one another. And the pro there's just so many 100%. people that need help. The people that need the help also need help. So everybody needs help. I need help. I need help probably right now. Uh, maybe Especially after that, that expansion, man. You're going to need help. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to need help, you know. That's like, you know, I'll even say that to so like sometimes like Tim will come over and we work out as soon as they're going well. I'm like, I need help. No, we need more stuff to get done. He's like, What's the problem? What's the problem? I was like, I had to do all of this and this. I was like, I always need help. We're not caught up. Nothing's done. Everything's a blank slate. We're starting over with what we already have. So we're not actually starting over, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's good to be on edge and a little dramatic. 
because you need that drive to, you know, do things. So that's kind of like even when I started doing like even more expos. The reason I'm doing more expos is, you know, just uh, talk to people, meet people in person. Um, not only sell hog nose, you know, I went and looked at redwood trees and stuff, um, you know, and then in Oregon, I didn't get to do too much. A little bit of time was focused on fixing the bumper, but that actually didn't take that long. That was fun. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, seeing all the mossy stuff out there was really cool. Uh, but I didn't get to like hang out to the, with that and, you know, look at stuff too much. Cause by the time I got out of the show, it was already almost getting dark. I only had like two hours. Yeah. Of light. Cool, man. All right. Um, so, you know, any last words you want to tell someone, the, uh, the audience tonight? Oh, thanks everybody for joining. Um, yeah. Thanks for listening to me and Alvaro discuss hog nose snakes in the market and everything. It's uh, been fun. I always like talking hog nose with other fellow hog nose people and that's what this has been once again and it's been with alvaro which is a first so i'm very excited to actually you know been able to partake in everything with this mm-hmm. because you know normally i'm just talking to joe all the time you know <laughs> i'm like what am i going to talk to somebody else is joe still here Where's no joe? And that's another thing you know yeah no he, he said he had to go to bed he's old yeah because he's not talking he's gotta... to me he's like i'm not talking to you guys get out of here We'll do it. I'll, talk, I'll be talking to him in a podcast, I'm sure, in another month. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's the thing, like, um, we talk about, like, getting information from the ball python community and what they've done. You know, I saw a lot of ball python um, podcasts going on. It's like, all right, where's the hug those people? You know, a, a good constant one and bringing different people on because there's a, we are growing. There's a good amount of hog nose breeders out there that are producing good, good hog nose and are doing the community right. I want, you know, to have a, a platform to bring everybody on. Yeah, no, that's, that makes sense. What ball Python podcast do you listen to? Man, um, let's see. There's um, MJ with, um, what's the name? Um, Trap Talk. Talk. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, he has a good amount of ball Python people on there, which he has a good variety too. Um, he's Constrictors. They have one too. Um, who else? I think I'm missing one too. Strictly ball python. I feel like I'm missing one more. Um, but there, there's a ham, there's a lot of them out there right now. Yeah, and no, the other is. thing is too, some of those podcasts you can also learn what not to do on some of them also. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, That's true for sure, man. All right, guys. Um, like like Jeff said, thank you for joining us. I mean, we had a good audience the whole time. Everybody was involved. Um, I know Jeff is working on a YouTube, right? Working on YouTube. Yeah, channel? you know, I should be working harder. Um, you know, I got the there's like, you know, I was looking at some of the videos that are all pre-recorded. We got a few, and there's like there's well, some of them there just need a little bit of stuff added to them. Very little. Um, and I found some with some uh editing mistakes, and so it's like the I gotta get my brother like he did a really good job. The thing is he's not a reptile person. Mm-hmm. And um, I kind of thought, I was like, man, there's going to be some issues here. I was like, you're going to edit these back at home and stuff. I was like, you don't really know what I'm saying with some of this stuff. But my uh, brother, he's very um, interested in filmography and um, even though anything. Like he already, he like, he grabbed a bunch of Kevin Rhodes books. I was like, why'd you do that? He goes, oh, I want to learn more about what you do and stuff and help with the filming. I was like, oh, interesting. Cool. Um, so I was like, hey, if you have any questions or any points, just ask me, of, you know, stuff about the snakes and whatnot but yeah i'm trying to get that up and going Should yeah so in, in, in the next couple months we're gonna see yeah drop a good amount of uh, deadline. yeah let's give me a deadline and something really horrible happens to me if i don't make that deadline so that way we can uh motivate me to do this all right so let's set a deadline tonight we're what the end of april last week of april all right so it's already may april's gone so we got to do may we're going to have to do May um, is a month where I can feasibly do some stuff. I do have to go to Salt Lake City. Um, let's put it at, like, because my breeding season is going to start picking up big time in, like, early June. I should be doing some breeding videos, too. Um, also, I'm breeding stuff now, but, you know, ho- luckily I'll have stuff breeding later, so I can be making videos about that as well. Um, let's put a deadline of, like, you know, like, June 15th. And if I don't get them done, then I have to give somebody, like, a really cool snake or maybe – I die or something. I don't know. Something really bad happens to me. Let's think. Right, well, guys. actually giving somebody a hog nose isn't really something bad that happens to me. But, you know. <laughs>
don't right. think I'm actually. So, so you guys heard it, June fifteenth. If you got, we don't start seeing some uh, YouTube from Jeff. Start DM him, ask him about the YouTube. I gotta give somebody like a really cool hog nose then, and if I don't, <laughs> I die. If there's no YouTube videos. If there's no YouTube videos. There we go, man. All right. All right. All right, guys, thanks for sure. Um, we're going to sign off on here. Jeff, stay back real quick once I end the, the broadcast. Um, make sure to go follow Jeff on Instagram. Um, you know, Subscribe, like this video, and subscribe to our YouTube. And we're going to ha definitely have um, – we have a good amount of other hognose breeders and different uh, reptile keepers coming onto the podcast, so stay tuned to that. Good night, everybody. Have a good night and have a good rest of the week. We'll talk later.